Right. Welcome, everyone. This is the October 3rd meeting of the Ellis Sprague's Village Council. We have already called the roll and all council members are present. Um, we just came out of an executive session. No decisions were made. Um, the, uh, the next part of the meeting are announcements. And I see uh, first on the agenda is Marty Heidi from Mike Turner's office. And she is here. I'd like to call her up to say a few words. <clears throat> Thank you. For the record, my name is Marty Heidi, and I'm Green County Outreach for Congressman Mike Turner. And periodically, I attend council meetings to kind of bring you up on some legislation issues and what the Dayton District Office, which is where the Congressman's District Office is, some of the things that we do. Um, tonight, I want to talk about two things. One is passports. Ten years ago, the law was passed requiring a passport to travel to Mexico and Canada. And uh, so you can imagine 10 years ago, everybody was scrambling to get a passport who you'd normally would go up to Canada or Mexico for vacation. And passports are good for 10 years. So this being the 10th anniversary, the website says four to six weeks for processing and when reality it's about six to eight weeks. So keep that in mind, holiday travel coming up. If you need your passport sooner, uh, call me at Congressman Turner's office. The number is 937. 225-2843. Um, I take care of passport expediting and we can get it in about 10 days. Uh, we had a guy called two weeks ago. He was calling on Wednesday. He was leaving Saturday. So we made an appointment for him up in Detroit. So we congressionally got a congressional liaison up there to schedule him and he drove up to Detroit where they can issue it on the spot. So I just wanted to let you know that that is the issue right now of delays and the Congressman Turner received a communication from the Department of State saying that as of June 27th they had processed six million passports. So that gives you an idea of their volume. The other thing I want to talk about tonight is the heroin epidemic. Um, uh, this has gotten a lot of news which it should because the purpose of my being here tonight is to encourage you as community leaders to be out in the community and talk about this. Have you heard? Did you know? Just talk it up. Make sure everyone knows and understands that this is not a recreational drug. This is starting out with pain pills sometimes. People don't just wake up and say, hey, I think I'll try heroin. Uh, this is starting out with pain pills. Pill mills were shut down, so they go to a less expensive method of the pain of get, taking heroin. And it has become an epidemic. Uh, Dayton was number one in the country for deaths related to heroin in 2014. And in 2016, they're running a close race with Cincinnati. And that is number one in the country, not in the state. Um, I brought a handout that you can pass down, please. This is current legislation that is present in, uh, in, in, in the Congress. And both the Senate and the House side, Congressman Turner has introduced a couple of uh, in, uh, legislation, legislation bills to combat some of the issues that people are facing. One being an amendment to the Social Security Act called the TREAT Act. After touring the Greene County detention facility, he realized that once an individual was incarcerated, they, um, their Medicaid medication stopped and they that what would happen is the sheriff's office would have to fork over the bill for the medication. Mm -hmm. And that was costing the Greene County Sheriff's Office about two or three hundred thousand dollars a year. So uh, he introduced legislation to amend that so that when they were incarcerated they could still get their Medicaid. Um, this is not costing the taxpayers any. This is just a continuation of Medicaid to the individuals that are going through treatment programs. Um, the other legislation that he introduced was the CRIB Act. After touring Bridget's Path in Dayton, this is for heroin addicted babies. And so he introduced legislation and that's the CRIB Act. And each, each has a number there that you can look up and kind of see where it is in the system. So if anybody has any questions, I did want to add one more thing. Um, this being not a recreational drug, it's important to talk to youth and everyone, really, that, that you try this, the minute you try it, you're basically addicted. So it's not a fun thing. So but, Marty, what about any educational programs? Well, Greene County has a, a community forum that is, uh, the first one I went to was about two years ago, held at the church, the Nazareth Church on Fair, 
uh, Fairfield Road. And they had about 250 people there, which I thought was really encouraging. Mm -hmm. uh, they have another one coming up. You can contact um, Judge Root and, Ju not, not Judge Root anymore, she got married. Uh, but Judge O'Diam, they put that together. You can contact them. I think it's around November 3rd, but I'm not sure where it is. But each time they have a meeting, they bring in speakers and they talk about issues. Getting people to talk in high schools uh, is another thing that is consideration. I don't know how you would approach it because I have contacted the Department of Health here in Greene County, uh, TCN, uh, all sorts of places. Nobody has a brochure, you know, that you could hand out at an event. So I think that's a really good step to kind of put together some kind of education materials to let people know. But so I'm kind of pushing someone to kind of create just facts so that right. people can, can see that. But you guys, you guys are out, so. All right. And treatment also. I mean, that we've mm -hmm. heard locally that there are issues, and in Greene County generally, that mm -hmm. there aren't enough treatment options. I mean, we really just have TCN, and um, mm -hmm. I've heard of people going to TCN in, in sort of an emergency situation, and there's no bed available for That's them. That's correct. And the CARE Act, which is, has signed into law by President Obama in uh, the end of or August, first part of August, that is a big funding mechanism for treatment, education, uh, monies. And so Congressman Turner held a forum with Congressman Sensenbrenner from Wisconsin where he had community leaders come in. The idea is not to have 10 different facilities doing the same thing and, you know, in other words, bring it in and let's coordinate efforts and get as much money as we can in the in the tenth district and that's what the efforts are right now and that money is available now it's not available yet but it has passed into law and they're divvying up in the states i think ohio is going to get about 19 million mm. okay any other questions any citizens questions for Ms. heidi nope. well thanks so much send thank our you. best thank to congressman turner and thanks thank for you. being here thank you very much other announcements from council members? Uh, I, I know Brian has some. Okay. Yeah, I have a few. <laughs> um, uh, so first of all, I, it came up that the Bulldog Jog is now uh, taking uh, sign-ups, and that, of course, is the day after Thanksgiving, so make sure to register for the Bulldog Jog. That's also called Yellow Friday <laughs> instead of the day after Thanksgiving. See, very good. Thank you. We're quite a team. Um, I also wanted to mention that the uh, eighth annual Yellow Spring Zombie Walk is going to be happening on the 15th. That's a Saturday. It starts around 4 p.m. And uh, that's always an amazing event. Also, uh, fundraising for Home Inc. and the Food Bank. Um, the Little Art is going to be showing um, As Ohio Goes, which is a new documentary that was produced by our own Think TV, part of PBS. Um, and actually, Greg Shell, who lives in town, was a part of uh, putting that together. Um, so October 16th is a Sunday, and uh, that's going to be really amazing. Um, and then, uh, if you get out of here quick, you can go to uh, Books and Beer, which is happening at the uh, Yellow Springs Brewery right until now. Until 8 or until 9? 8 8.30. 830? 8.30, yeah. Judith, did you have something? No. Um, I've got a couple things. I'm sure you'll all be surprised to know that Street Fair is this Saturday. <laughs> um, everything's on. Everything seems to be going well. We've got lots of great entertainment. The beer... Uh, music stage and beer garden here at the Bryan Center from noon until 7 and um, the entertainment down at the Swine stage down at uh, Jackson Lytle Lewis is being started by um, uh, Monica Hasek is doing a yoga um, yoga in the in the lawn so that should be a lot of fun uh, at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning um, and also the following weekend we have a new event called Open Studios Yellow Springs so it will be there will be 24 studios around the region open 12 of them are right here in Yellow Springs and so it will be relatively easy to walk to those 12 and the rest were, are probably within driving and, and walking distance so um, it's a free event there are actually 34 artists in 24 studios so it should be really exciting there will actually be demos going on so it's uh, it, it's kind of a new look a new event to, to really open up the studios and show what we have to offer and then Friday night uh, the 14th will be art stroll downtown and there will be shops and galleries open from 6 to 9 and I have a few announcements um, we're gonna 
roll with the pictures that Judy has up on the on the screen. The first one up there, I'm very happy to announce. Uh, congratulations to Johnny Burns, who's kind of hiding in the back of the room. Uh, Johnny is our electric and water superintendent for the Village of Yellow Springs, and he has been named the 2016 recipient of the Seven Hats Award, which is the American Municipal Power, uh, uh, it's their most prestigious award that they give out every year. And it goes to the utility manager from a smaller community who shows skill in seven areas, planning, design, and, uh, planning and design, administration, public relations, field supervision, accounting, personnel, and employee direction, and community leadership. And uh, it was really hard keeping this secret from Johnny for three weeks. Part of it, he was out of town on vacation, which was helpful, but it was a big surprise for him. He had no idea he was getting it, and then he had no idea that we were showing up to support him. Um, the little thing is not a halo. Oh, come on. He was <laughs> named was, a saint at the same <laughs> time. It was, it, it was saint a John. sunburst on the screen behind him, and they did take it out when they put him on the cover of the AMP update. And we're just waiting to see if he, number one, has to be in the September calendar next year because that's what the picture is every year in the AMP calendar for September is the recipient of the award. And it also puts him in the running for a national award from American Power Partner Association, Johnny. And uh, so we're waiting to see if he has to go to Florida in June of 17 to accept that award. And but he'll be wearing a crown. If he'll he be wearing that a one. crown. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations to Johnny on that one. Yep. Um, this is why I don't have a degree in anything. <laughs> Judy's trying to put up pictures that go with my announcements, God love her. Yeah. Um, so the next announcement I would like to make is a great big thanks to Jason Hamby and his crew for the beautiful new playground equipment that we have out, outside the Bryan Center here. Um, Jason's been working on that for a while. It's a grant through NatureWorks that we got, and um, he ordered that equipment, I think, what, a year ago, Jason? Yeah, and has been waiting on it, and it's finally in, and we had a very, very wet groundbreaking. Um, this is not the picture of the, well, the ribbon cutting. This is not the picture of the ribbon cutting because we were all holding umbrellas and doing this. But um, it's a beautiful uh, set of playground equipment, and um, they did a great job getting it out there. And Jason and his crew put that nice new thick mulch down there, so if you fall down, you're not going to get hurt. And uh, I think it's just a great, great job that Jason and his crew did. And, uh, the last announcement I have is that we did have a groundbreaking ceremony for the new water plant. Um, our funders showed up. Oh, oh, Judy's trying to find that one now. This will scroll later for your viewing pleasure. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, that was a nice bright sunny day, which was nice, and we were all out there in our hard hats, and um, it should be coming up here. There we are. Um, Brad was there. Brad is anxiously awaiting. Um, they have started construction out there, correct, Brad? Yeah. And so uh, lots of stuff going on in the village, and thanks to all of my crews for the hard work that you do every day. Thanks, everybody. Uh, next item on the agenda is the consent agenda, which just contains the minutes of the September 19th regular meeting. I'll take a motion. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Um, Review of the agenda, is there anything that we want to add to the agenda or change on the agenda? Uh, I'd like to add something. Okay. Um, I'd like to have a brief uh, <clears throat> uh, discussion uh, relating to a discussion I had with Patty about uh, housing development on the glass farm. Okay. Um, and Okay, I don't know if we want if we put it under old business. I, I think we should go ahead and put it under old business. I mean, it's... Yeah, okay. Anything else? Okay, um, Brian, do you want to review the petitions and communications? I certainly do. <laughs> um, so first of all, uh, there was a proposal to uh, do a welcome back art show in the uh, John Bryan Community Gallery. And that was also paired with a note from Patty um, asking about conditional approval. Patty, I thought maybe we could talk about that during your 
manager's report. Okay. Um, we also got a letter from um, David Deskins from the Green County Career Center letting us know that the uh, levy uh, is going to be up for renewal in November. Uh, that is not an increase in taxes and there's information out there about all the great work that they do for our youth and adults. Um, Green County Combined Health uh, gave us a nice uh, update about their dental clinic and all the service it does for the county. Um, NAMI had a flyer about their third Thursday series, which is going to be at the Clark County Public Library. And it's about what's new at the library. That is on, well, the third Thursday. And um, then we had all those great photos. And finally, there was a thank you letter from uh, Mrs. Bennett um, from Pat, for Patty coming to the class to talk about, what was it, organization? Um, yes, it was about um, organization and um, how the village interacts with uh, the citizens and other municipal governments. And great. Cool. Well, thanks for doing that. All right. Thank you. Um, moving on to public hearings and legislation, we have the first reading of ordinance 2016-44. Um, let's read these in, in full. <clears throat> Certainly. This is 2016-22. Uh, yes. yes. Okay. This is approving the right-of-way vacation request to vacate one alley off of West Langstone Street, whereas the village has received a petition from Carl Champney and Charlene Prestipino to vacate the right-of-way of an alley along West Limestone Street. And whereas the Planning Commission of the Village of Yellow Springs conducted a public hearing on said petition on September 12, 2016, in accordance with the Village of Yellow Springs Codified Ordinances, Section 1224.02. And whereas the Planning Commission and Village staff have recommended approval of the petition to vacate the aforementioned alley segment, now therefore counsel for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that, Section 1. The village does hereby vacate any interest it has or may have had in the subject right of way, except that the village retains for its future prospective use an easement for utilities and related purposes, and retains the same for the benefit of the public utility companies currently using the easement area for, for utilities and related purposes. Section 2, the petition to vacate right of way of an unused portion of an alley along West Limestone is approved. Section 3, the easement for electrical and utilities and related purposes along West Limestone Street is hereby approved. The vacated area and easement area are set forth in Exhibit A, which is attached here to and incorporated herein. Section 4, the Clerk of Council shall cause this vacation and easement to be officially recorded at the Greene County Recorder's Office 30 days after adoption of this ordinance. The Village Manager is author authorized to execute any documents to affect the vacation of the alley and easement as described above. Section 5, this ordinance shall take effect and be in full force at the earliest date permitted by law. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Denise, our planner, is here. Charlene Prestipino and Carl Champney uh, came to the planning office to uh, apply for a um, accessory structure. Uh, they're building a garage on their property. Um, they, uh, their contractor, Gregor, Gregor Con Construction, um, had uh, Put together a site plan for that there was an issue um, with the location of an existing structure uh, barn that's that's non-conforming um, that they were going to plan to remove um, in the process of meeting the setback requirement um, it was going to uh, require that they take down a tree um, which they didn't want to do they also discovered that do you happen to have that map by any chance you can put up there? Um, they, all, uh, yes. they, also, they also discovered that <clears throat> that portion of the alley, when they had a, a Richards off come out and look at it, has never been vacated. And they had always assumed it had. They actually own the uh, little non conforming strip on the other side of that alley. So, which little? To the to, west. To, to the west? Yes, to the west. Mm -hmm. I cannot figure out how that happened. So they actually own four separate <laughs> lots. <laughs> they have four, two, two of those, their, their house straddles two larger lots, and then there is one to the north, and there's one to the west on the other side of the alley. Mm -hmm. The um, alley hasn't functioned as an alley, as, as you can see from the drawing. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but if you see where that white car is, there's a big barn there next to that. 
in the alleyway if you go up a little bit that's actually that other little brown area is a shed that mm -hmm. has been there since the 1950s sitting right on sitting right on that straddling mm -hmm. the entire yeah and that's Denise can you just clarify the the red versus the black oh, the red is just ignore the red that's okay. just from the GIS um, gotcha. from Greene County depending on which wh which section you're clicking on so while that we really red is actually there to show that that's where they're it's going to end right that's the last little non-conforming lot that they own mm -hmm. okay did um i went over there to, to take a look at to take a look at it and um i was really surprised when you walk down the alleyway well there's trees and so on but you see that big square in the middle there which um is attached to a house out on dayton street and there's no, in my thinking, there's not any real, real access to it. I'm talking about the. Uh, off of South High? I'm talking, talking about if you go p down the alleyway, the black. Mm -hmm. You go a little bit, and then the alleyway actually yeah. keeps going mm -hmm. in the white. And to its left is a big piece of land, which oh. is about the size of a lot. And mm -hmm. it's, it's. It's a key, well, I don't know, is that what you call a key-shaped lot? The, it's like the backwards it's L like shape. It's like an L. Yeah. It's like an L. Backwards L shape. There. And um, my understanding is that that is the house that um, Dr. Portingo still works out of, partially, I think, lives on Dayton Street. And when you go over there, there's, there's not actually any access. I mean, it's, this is kind of fenced off, at least on parts of the sides. Uh, that wood it's all it's basically wooded <laughs> a wooded area that's about the size of a lot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, so what, what may have been an entrance many many years ago I don't know I mean obviously the little shed uh, that's sitting next to the barn has been there for a very long time and it's in very in great it's in disrepair and it's got to go <laughs> yeah right but um, so it's been this way for a very long time, but there is a, a big lot out there. I mean, it's connected to another piece of another property, but it's basically undeveloped. It's basically a wooded area. And so I was curious, you know, what happened? I mean, it's it potentially could be split off as a buildable lot. They just have to get an easement from somebody to have access to the lot. I mean, it's still a, it's it's large enough to be conforming as long as they can abide by but, the setbacks. But what's the access? It they, could be, it looks like off of South High. It yeah. looks like just north of. Yeah, there's the alley, right. the alley goes up and makes a, an L to the, uh, a sharp the, 90 degree to, and it oh. looks like it used to end at that lot. Well, well, I think so. we can't tell because this doesn't show all the way to Dayton Street. Yeah. But my sense is that this is a really large property that probably goes all the way. Well, it does go all the way. The, the, the alley, alley itself to doesn't go to Dayton Street. No, no, yeah. the property that Judith is talking about. Right. That L, but reversed the, L shape presumably the, goes to Dayton Street. And they, well, we don't know how many lots are owned by the Portinga household. I mean. But the other, the right. other end of the alleyway, which comes out on South High, is treed, you know, there's thick hedges. Um, and it looks like buildings are extremely close to that side and I just I mean I don't know what sh what should be done about it but there's a surprisingly in the middle of this block there's a, basically a woods which until you walk back there you would never have known so 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 are you um, concerned that that well could be that that portion that wooded portion could be separated out as a it lot could be yeah but, but there's then no then there's access no access to it then there would be no access to it potentially um, you know so uh, yeah that but was it's my also in that area that we're talking about it's only a 10 foot wide section so you have to consider that, that right yeah. right I mean typically they're 15 feet but in this case it's 10 so I, I just know we don't want, I know we had the problem uh, with the parking lot over behind Peaches that we have a house that basically there's no access to it. I, I'm not quite sure how it happened, you know, I'm sure it was an old part of town and somehow um, 
that happen. The only way to get there is through a parking lot. And so this kind of reminded me of that when I saw this, what's this fairly sizable lot in, that's connected, you know, maybe the people would never want to develop it, but. Um, well, those are, those, the railroad street situation, those are lots. I mean, or, or that is a street. I mean, there is a street. It's not, it's not really a parking lot. There, the street. Um, railroad street is, but I thought that older big house, the big brick house to the back. I think, well, there's the, there's the alley we next to it, it, isn't there? I think that there is some connectivity there. But it's not, it's not utilized that way. I mean, it's not, it's not being set up that way, but I do think that there is some <coughs> connectivity there. Um, I wondered, did, did uh, in the context of thinking about this, was the, the own, I guess back to the there. owner of that piece ever talked to or, I don't, I don't know. Oh, just, the property owners know. of Buddy, know. Know. yeah, yeah and adjacent to all received notices, and they signed petitions of support. So, so the Portingo household was? Um, the ones that are adjacent are Buddy, I'm it's not, not buddy. it doesn't it's, abut. It's within right. our we owned it on both sides. We didn't go that far, even. I mean, we did ask for our neighbors, but we're not actually abutting anybody. Right. Mm -hmm. The so alley, the alleyway abuts it. The, no, the, that well, alley doesn't abut anybody. The not, alleyway abuts their other property. They they own property no, on I both sides. I understand that, but I'm saying the alleyway as it keeps going. Oh, yeah. It, then it abuts that land. I but I would say that there's, there's probably a way to get back. There's probably a way on Portinga on this particular lot mm -hmm. on Dayton Street to get back, to get access back to that back lot if they wanted to separate it off. Well, and just so I'm clear, so Judith, the, the access off of High, you, you think that's too narrow from walking it's it? It's got big trees and... Okay, so it'd have to be cleared I mean, out or something? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, and the building... You see the one lot there, the building is very close to, if not over, maybe over that line. It's a little hard to tell. It looks like but it in the picture. It looks like yeah. it's slightly over. Yeah. But, you know, you can't go by that picture. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd have to find the It looks sense. very close when, you walk, close when you walk over there. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to draw people's attention to it. If you go out to Dayton Street now, there's no obvious way to get back there. It's you know, you're going through the yard, it's, you know, it's, it would be, so, anyway. Given that that's, it's not a street, would we be responsible for having to provide a street for those folks to get back into that L-shaped lot? I mean, that's part of the site plan review process that right. you do with planning. I mean. The property owner is going to have to have some way to access it. Right. You're, yeah, there's no street there now. I mean, right. there's the. I mean, we could, depending on using that existing alley, but if it's 10 feet wide, it's going to have to be wider than that. Right. Right. The the alley still has ac access technically. With the, the the entire alley is not being vacated. Just this piece of it. Right. So there's still technically access off of South High Street for it. I mean, it might be okay for a house, but if you're going to do a small cluster of homes, mm -hmm. there's going to have to be another access point. Another access. Mm -hmm. Was that discussed at planning? Did anybody? Was that raised? The idea of this the property on Dayton Street? Yeah. No. Yeah. And again, it doesn't abut the area that they're, we're vacating. Right. I mean, obviously, at some point in time, people just were building houses, people were building accessory structures, they were building garages, and nobody was paying any attention. They either weren't getting the appropriate permits, they weren't getting the appropriate zoning, they were planting trees, they were doing lots of things they shouldn't have been doing on property that wasn't theirs. And, you know, unfortunately, we're now stuck with a situation where there are a lot of these situations where, you know, Champneys are in a, in a kind of a difficult situation. They literally own a piece of property that abuts an alley. And um, I mean, that piece of property becomes totally useless mm -hmm. if 
Um, and it w was it only until when you came to um, when when Tommaso started looking into it that you realized that that actually was an alley? But you recognized it as an alley. You just thought it had already been vacated. I didn't recognize that there was an alley there. I just because there was a structure on it. Yeah, and so we just thought we. That's I didn't know why we had we four parcels. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I think that the original farmhouse, my our house is the original, 1870, probably, and the, the barn itself was built in 1900. Um, and because there's. But that was the original farm. And so I think that how we ended up with these partial lots for ours is that it got sold off in the 50s. I have all the deeds. So each one of these parcels you own, you purchased all of these parcels at one time. It was <coughs> all part of your original. You didn't purchase them at another time. Oh, that's interesting. OK. And, and in fact, our neighbor um, on Limestone, her driveway is actually built onto part of our I see that. I can see that right there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's just a funny situation. <laughs> when you see that back there, it surprised me. I was like, oh. So this is um, this is an ordinance, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's a first reading. Um, do we have any other discussion on, from council? Any comments, questions from citizens? Don? Um, regarding the property that Judy was talking about, I, if my memory serves me right, the porting has split off those two lots that you see at the, the top of the picture. So they are, you know, they created that situation when they split those two lots off. It was either them or the previous owner. Um, and that maybe happened around 90. Nine, two thousand, something like that. Those two, well, the two smaller ones there yeah. to the it, the yeah. right side of the L shape one. And I would suspect that the alley went through, and and that that alley that that alley went through to Dayton Street. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure it did go through to Dayton Street. So yeah. somebody took over that alley at some point, and it just got absorbed into the lot. Yeah. Um, the, the other <clears> thought is the line work that you see on here is um, it's not survey grade. So whatever you think, wherever you think something is, a surveyor really needs to go out and spot those pens. This mm -hmm. line work is, is best as can be based on a collection of information that comes together. So yeah, I mean, sometimes it's spot on and sometimes it's two and a half to five feet off. So take that yeah. into consideration when you're actually looking at the line work. Thanks, Don. I mean, I think if nothing else, this points out that it is absolutely imperative when anybody is doing any modification to their property, additions, anything to their property, they need to go through the zoning, they need to go through proper channels to ensure that they're not encroaching, that they're following the rules and not creating an untenable situation for a future property owner or for themselves. Um, you know. There could be situations where people are forced to tear down structures because they've built them where they're not supposed to build them. I mean, a lot of the trees just look like they grew up. Nobody planted them. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it just, I mean, that's the way that looks there. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a wooded area and it, um, but I guess the question is, is it if, if, say, someone wanted to build something back there at some point, um, would there be an access because I don't think South High Street really can be an access either it's very the way it looks when you walk there and look at it can there be an access from Dayton Street I just looked it up on the county auditors website while we were sitting here and I think that there is probably plenty of room there that if the the owner of that property that lives in the house over on Dayton Street wanted to split the back of that lot off there there should be plenty of room for them to give an easement access to go back to that property via driveway along the edge of it <laughs> bless you coming off of Dayton Street mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. okay are we ready to take a vote mm -hmm. yes yep. Judy would you please call the roll yes house 
Yes. Sims. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Hempfling. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. Uh, next is um, Ordinance 2016-23, and let's just read this in by title only since it's essentially the same language. Yeah, this is approving the right-of-way vacation request to vacate one alley off of West Center College Street. Okay, Denise. Oh, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay, Denise. Um, <clears throat> Stephen Bogner and Julia Reichner, Reichert um, were in the process of they tore down an existing structure. Did you have that, Judy? Yes, I do. Um, which now you can no longer see it in the in the area behind where the black line is to the um, uh, east, where that uh, structure is now located. That structure they came before um, the planning office in 2015 uh, with John Young and had torn down the accessory structure behind it and got approval for this office studio. When they tore down the accessory structure, they discovered the pin was underneath. And all this time they thought their yard was much bigger than it was. Um, so they have gotten have agreements with the property owner to the uh, west or the the west side. Um, that are on one that <coughs> excuse me are on center college and also with the property owner mr baldwin on xenia avenue to uh, buy a little portion of his land as well as going to be taking the full amount of the alley but this process is going to be they have to first get the alley vacated they'll have to come back for the lot split uh with uh it's a, it will be a temporary lot split because it'll be not it'll be coming in as non conforming, but then it'll be replatted. Right. And everything then will be as it should be. I mean everybody will have the exact properties that they're supposed to have once that's replatted. And that seems to be uh, uh, problematic, especially in this part of town. You could have that going all the way down a street. They could be off a little bit. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. As yeah, as and she just somebody seat. just said, <laughs> yeah, you, and you can't go by you can't, and you also can't go by the way GIS is. You have to look at the pins, but people often didn't even look at the pins. So in this case, we're going to eventually get this fixed. But but that portion of the alley um, was never used as an alley, and any uh, remembrance by any of the owners in that area. The, the the property though it does the the alley runs parallel between west center and west north and it is used to then go uh, north east a little bit behind mr baldwin's building at 716 at seven yeah four <coughs> which is kind of an enter entrance to a parking lot there right. a back entrance yeah that's an active alley mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the part that we're talking about vacating is overgrown, has trees, et cetera, and isn't used as a, a driveway of any type. No, it actually had a structure, again, straddling it until a year ago. And you said that was right behind the white building here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, right at the end of that alley vacation area? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so this is actually the, the portion that's being vacated is showing a little bit more, though, than where the property line is because they're actually going to be uh, a quick claim deed with Mr. Baldwin for a little extra land between his property and theirs. Any other discussion, questions? Any questions or comments from citizens? Um, Judy, would you please call the vote? Yes, McQueen. Yes. Sampling. Yes. Sims. Yes. Housh. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. And uh, Judith, I know Judith and, and Marianne both wanted to talk about um, we and we have alley vacation process on our agenda. Is is that do you see that as a long discussion? I'm kind of wanting to Denise to be able to um, leave if we can. Mm -hmm. I have. I don't have a long discussion. 
can we just let's let's so, just continue to do that now if that's okay, okay. Um, I I would like the Planning Commission to look at the whole alley system in the village and um, make a determination identify alleys that make sense to keep as alleys whether or not we can maintain them um, and some clearly are alleys that people are using even mm -hmm. vehicles some others like some that we've just been noticing are be very <laughs> difficult to use mm -hmm. given the nature of the alley and all the trees in them but to identify sort of priority alleys that we definitely want to save basically yeah and that's we we talked about that at the last planning meeting and hearing from uh, from Denise that is on our future agenda well, what I'd like to suggest is that um, I've, I've already talked with uh, uh, Green County and they're going to try to put together just trying to piece the alleys together using GIS is not possible we're, we're, we're going to be having our own GIS ability here with this time next year we would have, we'll be able to do this ourselves but um, right now we don't and so regional planning is trying to put together like a map book for us so we can something we can easily work at at the table maybe by on 11 by 17s or mm -hmm. maybe a little smaller so we can see where the alleys are mm -hmm. and then have that be part of a larger discussion um, as we go through and review the comprehensive development plan which is due to be reviewed well, and so I'm hoping that if we have a little bit of downtime in January February March is when we're going to be doing that and I would like Jason to be involved in those Absolutely. discussions with you as well Denise because he is responsible for maintaining any alleys that the, the village does not vacate so um, I have a strong feeling of not wanting to see us vacating alleys I mean I, I don't know I mean I think we almost mm -hmm. should have a I don't know I just like to weigh in to say that in general I think they're a great asset to the village um, potentially um, as walkways um, bikeways uh, etc and I I don't want to see us vacating you know because it's difficult for us to keep them up in fact as my understanding um, I mean I know you know Jason and uh, the crew take care of the alleyways that have gravel down and they put down some gravel you know when they get little potholes in them um, it's really as I understood um, that's the responsibility of the village and isn't it the responsibility of the uh, landowners on either side of the alleyway to trim back the yes. I know I, I know I got re uh, reminded that I needed to trim back my my shrubberies and so on and uh, mow the I mean generally I know in our alleyway people when they're mowing they mow the alley also but there's some I know there's one near me which is um, grassy and uh, it's not really used by cars and it's it it's one of those alleyways that could pretty easily end up with trees growing in it and those sort of things and I, I just want to not see that happen but if the if the adjacent <coughs> property owner doesn't maintain if they don't cut back the shrubs and they don't cut the grass then it does fall to Jason and his crew to do that because what has to happen is it's the same with your vegetation overhanging a sidewalk Denise has to send them a letter that says this is your responsibility and you but have they get assessed for that right no we don't have any process to assess for the cost of that we, we've never done that we've talked about it well I don't think we've, we've really done. reminded people have we oh but yes we have yeah. yeah I mean individually if there's something that's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. that's so, been a priority of Denise's and so uh -huh. I mean Denise sent out I, we just had a, a complaint about an entire neighborhood down on the south side of town and Denise had to send out letters to three or four streets worth of property owners um, and if we don't if we don't we have to send them a letter because if they're not notified we can't go out and cut it back so this includes when your tree is growing over a stop sign mm -hmm. yes the anything. village ultimately will take responsibility of the property yes yeah. anything like that I mean well, Jason and his crew spend a whole lot of time doing that during the summer hmm. yeah the ordinance requires you keep an eight-foot clearance but in that right away and if you don't and and we ask you to then it, it will be the crew that will have to come out and do it 
Uh. I agree with you. I mean, I think we should potentially be thinking about an assessment process, but that's, you know, that's again something else that, that perhaps um, Planning Commission could recommend or Denise or, or Patty could recommend to bring to council, but. Because if you I don't, mean, I mean. The language is there. I don't, if you don't, don't mow your do grass it. and the village mows it, then we do assess, right? There, yeah, like I said, there's language in, in these for assessing. It's just but, oh, we, we just don't do it. So well, the language. We, it, but we haven't, we haven't assessed anybody for anything since I've been here. Right. Well, that, okay. That, mm -hmm. that's. Um, so the other thing is my understanding is the default uh, under our zoning is that we do maintain um, the alleys. Is that true? I mean, unless it's, unless it's not usable. I mean, so like some of the things we looked at tonight are exceptions. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. In right. fact, Jason, Denise, and I had a meeting in my office the other morning where we tried to mark every alley that, that the crew maintains on a village map, and there were little yellow highlighter marks all over that thing. I think rather than talk about individual situations, I think we need to, have to, to give Denise direction to do what she's talking about doing. We need to look at the whole plan. We need to understand all of the different situations instead of trying to talk about what each each thing. I mean, we've you know you're talking about maybe having it in March, having it ready for us to look at in March. Um, who knows if there will be any alley vacations between then and you know. Mm -hmm now and then probably not it's not the construction season so i'm guessing that those usually happen in the construction season so um we can we can always turn down an alley vacation it's yes. it's our decision so we can turn it down um i don't know that we should be telling planning commission not to hear them i think they can hear them and we can refuse them well i just think we need to look at it holistically right and exactly we uh you know we just want to be careful if there's some really positive public uh, uh, good that can come of alleyways that you know that we're not vacating those. I mean, so it's something. it's my understanding that that it is a directive of planning commission to to maintain passable alleys and or maintain in terms of not vacate them, mm -hmm. so that that is a priority. And this idea that they could be passageways that that would be a priority of planning commission if it's not it's a misunderstanding i had i don't well um, it's like in the in the comprehensive development plan it has more to do with if it's identified as any ability for to be a connector okay for automobile tra automobile traffic but i don't know if we have it in there for walk walkways well, okay yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, but i think i think you know getting this map identifying the alleyways i think that's a great start yeah me too yep um i just wanted to mention one other thing kind of a general note uh i love the summaries that you do um and i just wondered when we are making these decisions related to planning commission if the minutes are available it'd be good to have them in the packet from the planning commission yes previously. yeah okay. just yeah. just to yeah. i mean I, I think you highlight everything but mm -hmm. i don't know i guess i like to read I, I probably part of the reason judy hesitates to do that is that they haven't been approved at least in this situation they probably mm -hmm. hadn't Correct. been approved okay but they could always be put in as draft sure yeah. sure thanks sure. thanks denise mm -hmm. thank you um, we'll go back to um, ordinances we've got ordinance 26-24 we can, oh, let's go ahead and read this in in full. Well, wait a minute, is that a long one? It is not. Okay, let's just read that in in full then. It's not odious. Um, this is repealing section 414.02 of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 414.02 regarding the placement of stop, stop signs on High Street at Whiteman Street. Whereas codified ordinance section 414.02 of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, requires stop signs and yield right of way signs at through streets. And whereas the village council has determined that it would be in the best interest of the village to adopt a new section 414.02 entitled through streets, stop and yield right of way signs of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio to provide for the placement of two additional stop signs on High Street at Whiteman Street to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of the village. Now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that, Section 1, 
Section 414.02 entitled Through Street Stop and Yield Right of Way Signs of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio be repealed. A new Section 2, a new Section 414.02 entitled Through Street Stop and Yield Right of Way Signs of the Court of Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio be enacted to read as set forth on Exhibit A with new language in bold, which is attached here to and incorporated herein. Section 3, this ordinance shall take effect and be in full force at the earliest date permitted by law. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Patty, is this yours? This one is mine. Um, if council remembers, a, a few meetings ago, we had um, Shia Fields came with a petition um, requesting that stop signs be put in on um, High Street at Davis, I believe. Um, however, Chief no. Hale. Oh, yeah, that, I'm sorry. You're right. Uh, Chief Hale went out, looked at the traffic patterns, and suggested that they be moved one block south to Whiteman to break up that long stretch between stop signs. Um, council did agree to that, and this is the first reading of the ordinance to allow uh, Jason and his crew to place those stop signs. Okay. And so just to be clear, so we're moving signs or we're adding? No, we're adding. Okay. Yeah, I think if we want to be more walkable, I think the more signs, stop signs, intersections we have, the better. Well, it, it, and it, a lot of kids in that area. It is a, uh, currently it is a five block straight shot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, high, high. and High Street's a busy street. So. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? Well, a question oh. prior to, uh, to Judy. It, we say the earliest date permitted by law, when would that be, 30, roughly? 30 days from your second reading. Okay, so. I think somehow we, we we would need to notify the public that that's going to happen, and uh, since it's sparse meeting and it'll probably be a sparse meeting again, so that they're well aware that there will be stop signs. Well, and, and I'm sure Chief Hale's enforcement would be uh, warnings for at least six months. Correct, Chief? Isn't that the normal course? Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Any comments or questions from citizens? Judy, would you please call the roll? We'll, we will have another reading for this. Yes. Housh. Yes. Hempfling. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Sims. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. Um, next, we have resolution 2016-50. We will just read this in by title only. All right, this is authorizing the village manager to submit applications for federal FAST Act funds through the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Melissa, I think this is your project. Yep, I can take this. Okay, so this is a resolution um, to uh, submit a grant through the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission. Um, for 63 sidewalk curbs with ADA compliant ramps and domes. Staff has been working to upgrade all of the sidewalk ramps around town that are in areas that are very near to the uh, central business district and um, on the streets that connect to the schools. And uh, the village has um, completed some of that work with the streetscape. Um, we did get a CDBG grant a few years ago, I believe it was in 2013, to uh, put some of those in. And then we just got approved for another CDBG grant through Greene County um, to do some of the ones along uh, Xenia Avenue, which I think was announced at the last council meeting. So we have 63 left. Um, that we had identified as being um, pretty important um, in terms of walkability to the uh, the schools in the central business district. So these 63 sidewalk uh, ramps would be Dayton Street, Elm Street, and West South College Street. Um, and this would make a uh, complete loop around the village um, from Dayton to Xenia to West South College and then up uh, East Enon. Right. Yeah, East Enon, even though there aren't any ramps because there aren't any, aren't any uh, side streets except for the uh, Dayton and West South College uh, corners. Um, so this would be a local match required of 37930 and then uh, we would be looking for uh, federal dollars in the amount of 101250 So the total project would be 139180 if we were fully approved. So. 
Um, we'd applied for this in 2015 and we didn't make it, so we're trying it again in 2016. Um, I don't think that the award comes until 2022. So even though it's a 2016 application, the funding would still be uh, far off for this. Um, so it would give us plenty of time to uh, plenty of time to plan ahead if we do have to come up with that uh, almost $38,000 match. So that's what's in front of us. Are these just on one side of the street or on both sides? Um, you know what? It's been so long since I've looked at this. I believe that they are... There's 63 of them, so they might be on both sides, but I would have to look at my kind of as engineering. Yeah, what, West sure. South Collins, I think, has one, has no, one, one well, has two at uh, Talos, but I have, I'm one side of the street, but most of them are, would be on the uh, I, I mean, I north guess I'm, side. especially so. on Dayton Street, if I'm wondering about the, the horizontals, I'm wondering about the the crosswalks crossing Dayton Street, do they have, are they going over to another ADA compliant crosswalk or ramp? I on the honestly, other side of Dayton Jason, Street? Jason, do you know if they're on the other sides of the streets? Because I'm not 100% sure. That what you said was true. I think they're both on both sides except for Zinni Avenue. Zinni Avenue yeah. is only on the west side because the east side has already been done. Except for in okay. the central business district. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so at least on those streets, Everybody, there, there will all be accessible. Okay, cool. I think that that. I mean, 63 is a lot. That I need to look to. Yes. Just 63 is a lot, so I would think so. Yes. Do Do you know how they handled the on Dayton Street on the west side the tree? There's a big. We have to go in front of adoption over, link. But that's a, yeah. but that's not. Is there a crosswalk? I don't know if there's a crosswalk. No, but if you're going to make it ADA accessible via ramp, but that the sidewalk itself isn't. Wow. Well. Yeah, that would just do the ramp. We would have to look. Okay. okay. Well, the and there's a really bad section in, in front of Dr. Portengo's too. Yeah. There's been a there's there's some bad spaces on both sides of that street, especially. And this is just ad addressing the ramps at the intersections. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Right. Can I ask a I guess a question about the summary, um, and I don't know if you know this or not, Melissa, but uh, the last sentence of the first paragraph says uh, this will bring into compliance over 42% of our sidewalk curbs, which that doesn't make sense to me, I guess. It, it, I mean, it seems to me like that number should be much higher. I mean, not only from these existing ones, but you know, out of the 164, if the other ones were in compliance, I, I guess I just want to where were, you, where were you at, Brian? I'm sorry. Uh, first paragraph, last sentence. Not that one. Not that one. Oh, it's this so, one. So maybe we can just check that because I think our compliance much must be much higher. Well, if you look at the sentence before, it says we have just received upgrade for 16 along Xenia Avenue. Right, but 184 remain. But what we're talking about if if this is awarded. I mean, this is well, this, this is yeah. This is 79 out of 164, so that's already 50 percent. But I guess I just like it to be yes. But it says when they did the survey, 164 were not in compliance. So that's not the total number in the village. So if you're thinking that's the total number in the village, right? So the total number in the village is the rest, higher than 164. Right, yes. and the rest should be in a compliance, right? That's correct. That's so, correct. so let's just clarify that because I'd like, I mean, I'd like it to be accurate what our compliance level is. It should yep. be a lot higher. We can definitely look at that. I know that, um, you know, we this same total overall project has been submitted a number of different times and revised. So we can we can take a look at that for sure. Cool. But this looks great. And and I I would assume as you're writing the grant, um, yeah, have you written the grant? Um, yes. Okay. But because um, MVRPC is prioritizing walkability and complete streets, and I assume mm -hmm. has that been included, that language yes. been included? Okay. Denise and I both attended MVRPC's uh, training session on applying for the funds. So okay. Good. We were in the know about everything that they're requiring and looking for and needing. Cool. Any I, other questions? I, yeah, I do. Did I hear right that you said we wouldn't get the money till? 2022 correct and that's eight years from now correct is that right eight years from now? this is how far out they're planning no, six years from now 
Now, they did say that um, some of the smaller projects, they could be pushed forward um, because, you know, some of the projects that are, that are funded um, through MVRPC are projects that are much larger than ours. So it could potentially be funded sooner, but they tell everybody 2022. That's what we should expect. What if, if we actually found a source of money before then? Would that we could revise. That? I mean, that would definitely help. We could get awarded now, and then um, let's say we, we get another grant that knocks off another 20 or 30 of them. Then we would just need to revise the amount that we are approved for. Mm -hmm. okay. It's definitely not, even if we are awarded, it's, it's definitely not going to prevent us from you know, okay. continuing down okay. this path Thank to try to get it done. for doing this. But we need to use, we need to not commit that we're going to do, do the work and then not do it. Absolutely. Even if we're doing it out of, out of other money, that's fine, but we can't not do that. We can't do that to MVRPC again. Yes. Um, okay. Again. Mm -hmm. again. Oh, we've given back the ODOT grant for the CBE was through MVRPC, as was the Northern Gateway grant. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Now's the time in the agenda where we hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. We ask that you come to the microphone, state your name, and keep your remarks to three minutes. Doesn't look like we have any. Um, we'll move on to, we have no special reports, so we'll move on to old business. The first item is um, impact of utility extension in the Jacoby Greenbelt Preservation. Um, Krista McGaw is here from Tecumseh Land Trust. It's something that uh, we discussed at the last meeting when we were talking about uh, potential utility extension to the CBE property, and we asked you, uh, Krista to come and talk about those issues related to the Jacoby Greenbelt. So she's here with paperwork, yep. and great. It's been a while. <laughs> It's good to be here. Um, can you find it? Is it? Which one is it? <laughs> if you start by date, it would be today. Can you? No items. No. <laughs> no items match my search. The very same USB key worked earlier today, but you have got a handout in front of you, so I am not going to let that deter me. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, it seems like it's just been a long time, really, since I talked to you, but I've been enjoying working with the Environmental Council on uh, the, the uh, Glass Farm Project, the restoration there. And uh, we're nearing completion on the Yellow Springs Creek project as well. So we've definitely been working with, with uh, council and the commissions and um, I think making some good progress. And the, we're working, of course, with the priorities from uh, the current environmental uh, commission, uh, which is a little bit different than what we were working with in the past. Um, and I, I think most of you are familiar with what we do at Tecumseh Land Trust. Uh, we uh, recently adopted an eight-word mission statement, protecting local farmland, water, and natural areas forever. Uh, it's a bold thing to do, but it's what we're committed to do. Uh, we're one of 1,700 land trusts across the country. Uh, and since being founded in 1990, we've protected now over 25,000 acres in 144 properties. <coughs> Our big picture goal is to protect 100,000 altogether in Clark and Green, and that's about a fifth of the total land mass. So that's mm. kind of what's recommended as far as protecting land for continued agriculture and protecting water resources as a part of that. Um, our vision in general is to protect those masses of land necessary for water quality and farming and to do that in blocks of three to five thousand acres. We now have a couple of blocks indeed that are uh, contiguous that are that big and we're coming close to that actually uh, on the the east side of Yellow Springs uh, with with Glen Helen and Whitehall and the, the preserve farms across the uh, uh, northern edge of the, the village. Um, we haven't really worked on a green belt with any other local government entity, 
Uh, land trusts have a little bit of a fear of a green belt in that um, the example of Boulder, Colorado uh, is, is, is one to, to be noted. Um, they preserved a green belt and then they jumped the boundaries. And so they took all their infrastructure over to the other side of the green belt that they had preserved and so they really didn't save on costs. So um, the, using a green belt can be a really good idea but you have to be pretty clear on where you want it to be and um, you know, make sure that you're accounting for um, the amount of development that you do think you're going to need to have in your, in your municipality. Um, Can I ask a question about that? Yeah. Uh huh. So, um, given I, I don't, we're not Boulder, but no. what? Uh, <laughs> we're not. I, I, yeah. <laughs> um, what would you have suggested Boulder have done? They they needed to 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 perhaps have made a better plan, um, have estimated better what they were going to do, or or to have made maybe not a solid green belt. You know, they just didn't really anticipate. So they actually jumped over the green belt. So they kept the green belt as a green belt. And yeah, which is a nice over. amenity, but as far as any kind of infrastructure cost savings, that Not didn't really happen. work. Hmm. So, and in that most, uh, I, I'm building up to the fact saying that Yale Springs is an unusual place in terms of setting such clear priorities over the years and, um, and sticking with them. And they seem like they've fairly much worked to date. So, I, you know, I think that, that Yellow Springs has been on a good track of trying to really look forward and, and avoid that kind of mistake. Um, we really celebrate urban vitality and denseness. It's a great complement to what we do. Um, you know, we really like to see revitalization in Springfield, infill in Yellow Springs. It's, it's, it's good. It, it really complements uh, our efforts to, to keep um, the, some areas open and, and available for agriculture and, and habitat purposes. Um, we want to work to protect those areas that are logical to protect in terms of plans for infrastructure, also in terms of habitat protection, water quality protection. And so we really try pretty hard to work carefully with um, properties that would align with local and state government plans for conservation. Um, the village absolutely unique uh, in having established land use plans early on, uh, early in the 60s, um, beginning with the, the plan for the country common. Um, we like to have plans partly just because we don't want to have to get out there with picket signs every time there's a new development. You know, we like the idea that we're working together to look ahead and that um, we know sort of what we're working with. We work a long time with landowners in order to, to work on a conservation easement. It's a serious decision for them. And so we really try not to reach out to people unless we feel like this is a logical property to, to protect. So we don't really canvas universally. I mean, we really reach out to people who we think are in areas that make sense to continue farming or to preserve for conservation purposes. Um, the country common idea, which I think is familiar to a lot of you, but just to say briefly, uh, was really unusual. It was before the current law that we work under at the state and federal level. Um, and essentially it worked under common law. Uh, a lot of the owners of open space area uh, in and around the village agreed to swap conservation easements in essence. So Glenn Helen said to John Bryan, you keep us honest, we'll keep you honest. And in essence, they were enforcing easements kind of on each other, on their neighboring properties. Um, it was an innovative idea. Explain that again. I'm There's, there, so the village held some of the easements of neighboring properties, and then um, the perhaps the college held easements on some of the village property. Mm -hmm. And so it was an idea under common law that people would actually just make a deal, you know, to agree that we are going to keep this space open. And the country common sort of concept comes from the idea that you would have a real o big open land mass owned by multiple owners, but with everybody honoring that idea to try to keep it open. So that included John Bryan, the scout camps, 
And there's actually planning classes that use use that example as kind of a really early attempt to try mm -hmm. to, to do good land use planning and, and at the, the level really of, of the village being a, an important player. Um, the, uh, it began, or it actually built up to about 2,000 acres, mostly east of Yellow Springs. And the hope was to expand it even more. On the back of your package is the map of where we have permanently preserved properties. Um, the, the darker green being the preserved properties. The uh, sort of tree design being John Bryan. And uh, you can see we really have gotten almost two thirds of kind of that whole green belt area preserved, but there definitely are some holes on the, the west side. Uh, the green belt concept got added as far as I can tell in 1967 with uh, a planning process on the part of the village. Uh, the idea being that not only would this open space be preserved and buffered on the east side of the village, but that would actually go all the way around the village and that it would protect the Jacoby Creek area. And that uh, was partly for the purpose of protecting water as well as differentiating Yellow Springs from uh, Dayton as it was growing and kind of sprawling eastward on the west side of, of Yellow Springs. Um, then, in the early 70s, to further the innovative record of the village, um, the voters, as I understand, put in place an income tax to uh, put funding into a green space fund, but also to create a fund for new businesses. I think it might largely have been used as a loan. I'm not sure about all the details of that. But that, again, was a very interesting thing to, to put together. Um, a fund that would benefit development and green space protection at the same time. Over the years, the funding sources have changed, but there has continuously been a green space fund at the village level. Again, something that, that's really unusual and has definitely helped us to do um, much of what we've done and, and was essential, really, to the preservation of Whitehall Farm. Um, the, Different iterations of land use planning that have gone on have generally just reinforced that, that green belt co concept. Um, there's parts of the green belt that have been prioritized by uh, the current council and the, the current environmental commission, but essentially um, people have kept that will to, to try to create that green belt and to uh, preserve the identity of the village um, and, and have been successful in, in doing that. And then the most recent processes really were in 2009 and 2010 with the visioning process and the, the update of the comprehensive plan. And uh, they basically really reinforced kind of the plans that had gone before then. Um, the Center for Business Education was also uh, in the, that pl the, the planning process, the uh, discussed both in the vision and the comprehensive uh, land use plan update. And the urban service boundary, um, I've added to the map on the west side of Yellow Springs um, just to kind of show what um, the thinking was, I think, as that plan was updated. Um, and that urban service boundary was really driven by how far gravity sewer, as I understand it, would work. And so that was kind of an infrastructure delineator there that was a part of that plan. Um, there was a good bit of discussion in the, the planning process about um, how that um, plan for the CBE could be compatible with the Greenbelt with the green belt kind of creating a hard boundary and there not being development beyond that and certainly not leapfrogging it. Um, the restrictions also that were put on the CBE plan at the time uh, were aimed to try to make it compatible with the downtown. There was just a lot, a lot of discussion about that and many of you were a part of it. Um, that you didn't want to have commercial competition, uh, on the, the site selected for the CBE um, with the downtown. 
area, that you wanted to keep the commercial downtown and keep um, you know, the potential for job creation at the CBE, but in areas that wouldn't be competing with, uh, with the downtown. Um, recently I've been asked whether the CBE would make the Greenbelt more expensive. Um, you, you might want to seek an appraiser's opinion. I am not an appraiser. Uh, but most frequently the type of development that goes on and would work within our zoning code in Miami Township is large lot frontage splits. So you split off your three acre lot and I think it's 300 feet of road frontage uh, along an existing road. And uh, as long as you, it, the soil will perk and you can do a septic system, um, you're, you're really can pretty easily do that type of, of land conversion. So that's what happens most often generally when appraisers look at what the value of a rural property would be for development. What they're comparing is comparable sales where um, the, the buyer intended to do those road frontage splits mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what they paid for the raw land, as it were, at that point. So, so are you saying that most likely the land we're talking about in terms of the Jacoby Greenbelt, if it were to be developed, would be developed into these large lots as opposed to a developer coming in it's and the, having the wherewithal and finances to do a, the infrastructure necessary for subdivision. It's, well, it's the most likely. Yeah. I mean, it's what happens most often. And so when appraisers, you know, appraise the, the, the value of a conservation easement, which is mm -hmm. what we would hope for with mm -hmm. the Greenbelt properties, they are looking at comparable sales at market unrestricted level and then comparable sales after an easement is in place. And so the comps that they're going to use are those big lot splits, not because they would be hard pressed really to find a lot of big rural developments in recent times to compare it to. So it's, it could happen, but I think it's fairly unlikely in any kind of a I mean, and, in order and short time. Township frame. zoning really doesn't, um, it doesn't have much for commercial zoning. I mean, I don't, especially no. in that area, I don't think that. Oh, for something commercial, that yeah. would be fairly hard, I think to do anything commercial. And, and we wouldn't extend, you know, it's up to us right. to extend the utilities. And if we decide, Unless Fairborn, I was going to say, I mean, <laughs> it, well, it's not Fairborn. It's not. It's going to be Green Green County. County. Green County is our is the biggest threat. They've got their own water and they've got their own sewer. They're already they already have the tower down at West Enon. They would be the threat to extend utilities the other way. Hmm. The the biggest challenge I think to the Green Bell, which I you know still from from all signals that I get is still a really popular idea um, among the people of Yellow Springs, uh, is the, the having the money in the right time frame when the priority landowners decide to sell. So we try to keep in touch with the people who are in those priority areas. We send them letters, we try to not annoy them, you know, we try to just in a, in a nice low-key way say, hey, there's these opportunities, you know, if you're thinking about selling, let us know. Um, if you're thinking about maybe getting, you know, selling an easement so that you could recoup that value and that do something with that, that would, that would work for you and your family, um, here's some funding sources that we're working with. So, our uh, letter to landowners who have properties identified as a uh, good potential for preservation uh, went out a month or so ago. And so we hear back from people who have interest. Uh, we try to follow up with people in certain priority areas, but again, in a pretty low key way. Um, the properties near the Western Gateway are owned by folks who really have not got any particular interest in selling a conservation easement at this point. Um, there is one landowner to the west who certainly has said that he hopes to be able to preserve the creek no matter what he does with the rest of his land. But really, other than that, um, I would anticipate that at some point it's very likely landowners will die and their family members will then have to decide what they want to do. What that means, if it's a really big priority then, is that the, the most effective thing to do at that point is to buy that land, to make an offer 
a reasonable offer in a timely way to then put conservation easements on those properties and then sell them again. And that's something that the land trust did with the village a long, long time ago on a couple of properties. It's not ordinarily the model we use because it's a lot more cost effective and um, more, um, uh, it's, it's easier in many ways. It's certainly more routine. It's not exciting like the Whitehall Farm Preservation, but um, generally working with existing landowners, uh, we get the commitment from the landowner, we pursue the funding, but it takes a couple years at best even if the funding can be lined up. And so if you have a situation where someone's passed away, there's no interest in really retaining this land anymore, then you, know, you have to, to move more quickly. So that's really a challenge for us. Um, Krista, yes. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, if the village were uh, to say we we're committed to working on preserving these properties along the Jacoby Creek, what would be a rough ballpark estimate of money that we should have set aside in order to do this model that you're talking about, buy the property, put the easement on, and sell it? I'm going to have to get back to you on that. OK. Uh -huh. but and do you want just the priority properties on the west side and the well field, just those? Uh, we're just or talking about the Jacoby just, just right now. On yeah. the west side. But I'm not sure that we would want to sell the Jacoby back again. I mean, I. The creek itself, yeah, maybe not. Right, I mean, that, yeah. you know, that's something to think about, too. I mean, I think we would maybe want to sell back the farmland, the, the tillable land, but I don't know that we would want to give up the Jacoby property. Mm -hmm. There'd be a lot of options. And I mean, I know that there's, there's been some discussion about young farmers looking for land, and you know, there, there'd be a variety of ways that you could figure out how to resell that land to achieve different goals. So, I mean, would that be a possibility? So say that the I'm just thinking of the one on the north side of Dayton Yellow Springs where the creek runs through. If, if we would work, we would find a farmer who would want to buy that property, but we would get the easement, we would kind of do it together and they would agree to put the easement at least on the 50 feet, 100 feet on either side of the creek, but they would buy the land, we would give them part of that, you know, we would give them money to cover that easement. Is that something that can? It's work. possible. It's so possible. we wouldn't buy the whole thing. It's, we it's, would just buy the creek. The, the question would be how quickly you'd be able to line up that willing buyer, you know, and that's 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 the biggest challenge. I, you know, we, we do try to keep track of people who want to do a conservation buy because we do hear from people who know about, for example, the federal tax benefit they can get from donating a conservation easement on land. And we know people who already own land and want to buy land in the area to expand their farming operation or buy adjacent land in order to to get control of that land so there's a lot of reasons for that um, and I, I you know I can think of some people who might be interested in that that land but I don't know you know for sure that they would that would want to do it and it's not really right. appropriate for them to yeah, you know, yeah, no, I, make designs at this point but I mean we would certainly try to reach out to people and see if we can do that um, there's um, definitely, though, a possibility that there might not be somebody in a real timely way. Mm -hmm. um, and, I'm, you know, in that case, to get control of the land um, is the surest fire. But then we could always solution. farm it, just like, you know, let's just say we would buy a, a farm. Yeah. We could always farm it and sure. um, at least cover the co oh you could the cost. you could resell it you could resell it I mean there's okay. there's a pretty good demand on land farmland and any kind of land in Miami Township I think so I, but yeah, can we can we restrict the sale though could we sell it only for agriculture you could um, you know basically you can put those conservation easements in place that include conservation features uh, besides just a basic agricultural easement. So you can have a stream buffer of 250 feet on either side of the stream, some restrictions as far as um, retaining streamside forest to prevent erosion. Um, absolutely. I mean, Glen Helen's a great example of a property that has a whole lot of variety in the conservation easement limitations of different parts of that, of that property. Uh, I was going to say that when the Whitehall farm uh, sale happened, 
I mean, that was what was kind of ama so amazing that happened was that at the last minute, uh, you know, somebody who wanted to buy the land with the help of the cons that they were negotiating that during an auction <laughs> was kind of crazy. But, it, you know, it came together. Yeah, I mean, really it, it was, it was very exciting. It was know, very but exciting, it, but it was terrifying it was, also. <laughs> yeah, well, and everybody I know from the land trust who was, was working with that project says that it could have gone wrong easily. Yes, you know, I mean, they, just, they were not that confident, really, until, <laughs> until it was done. The annual, I very much appreciate that council has continued to make annual appropriations to the, the Green Space Fund. That's great. Uh, and for working with current landowners who want to sell a conservation easement, that is, um, is, is probably adequate unless we have a whole bunch of things that hit at one time and have to, you know, kind of choose among priorities. But we're able to draw down state and federal funds with some regularity and um, with local match available, there's, there's quite a bit that we're able to do. Um, that, that fund has gotten spent down a little bit, but it's getting rebuilt. Um, and so it's it's that's good that's good for the for the plan situation with people who want to sell a conservation easement. There's a good bit that we can do with that. Um, I, there have been people that have suggested to me that a potential source of revenue might be from sales of any village lands um, as you make your plans for some of the different properties that the village owns. Um, I mean that could be the case of the CBE. Um, that could be the well Sutton Farm you're going to be selling pretty soon. So um, that would certainly be an interesting source of revenue that would also kind of connect, uh, well certainly with the CBE land, it could connect development and green space protection together, which is, is kind of unique, but, but kind of a nice uh, blend as well, um, because you're really making that direct connection. We're developing some land, but we're also going to make sure that we're preserving uh, land at the same time. Um, and then there is a, you know, if, in, in the clinch, you know, would we be able to perhaps work out something in the short term to buy land with the idea of reselling it once, once conservation easements are in place? Um, and, and that would certainly be, um, the, if we were sitting on a couple million dollars, that'd be great, <laughs> not doing it. <laughs> but, um, but we would, you know, try, to, to work as, as efficaciously as possible as we could with the, with the village in that kind of a situation. Um, what's next, I, from our perspective, um, there, there's been pretty clear priorities on development and on green space. Um, it seems like we need to kind of revisit those priorities, reaffirm them or revise them to benefit everybody, you know, in and around the village. Uh, and we are very happy to continue to work with you in whatever way we can as um, you look at what the, what the future plan should be. I think it could be help, it would be helpful if, um, if it's possible to come up with some kind of a figure of, you know, what, what, would, what we would need in our green space fund. To be ready, right. Would, and you're especially thinking of a sale or or easement or both. I could, I mean, I can look at both and give you some kind of ballpark estimate. Um, so, although sometimes when it comes to real estate, it's not always a good idea to show your hand either. Well, I'm imagining if we were in a position where we had to buy a farm, say. I mean, I'm imagining we're getting a mortgage or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. We just have to have enough to get us. We have to have enough to 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 get us to a, that. Yeah, place. I mean, the village can certainly guarantee a loan. I mean, you'd be in a good position to do that. Okay. Now, given f what I've heard, is we really don't know what impact right now the CBE would have, or the land that we have has on the green belt. On the value of it? On the value of it. And would it, the, the price of that green belt land that we, that we see will 
dramatically increase? Because I think what I heard you say that for a developer to come in, he would have to have some deep pockets yeah. <laughs> to, yeah. to, to, to right. do something that we fear. Right, and, the, and the, the reason it would be valuable to them, the, the green belt would make the CBE more valuable. That's what I'm saying. For sure. It it would make, because the CBE people always look out their window, right. you know, and I mean, as that would be occupied. Um, in the other direction, though, it's, I mean, you could get an appraiser to look at yeah. it, but it looks, it, it would have to be somebody coming along with pretty deep pockets right. who would be able to put in that initial in infrastructure. That would be more expensive because of it not being a slam dunk to hook up to village services. Correct. Okay. I mean, personally, I consider three acre lots the worst of development. It's a waste of resources. It doesn't bring in revenue to anybody um, much. I mean, certainly it would bring in property taxes for the schools. There's no income tax revenue, and it and it uh, takes up all the road frontage. And there's no there's no you know, it just reduces the amount of agriculture available. So from that standpoint, that, you know, I don't like that idea. And that is beautiful frontage. Mm -hmm. So it probably would be pretty valuable if, uh, if somebody just wanted to divide it up into three-acre lots. Yeah. yeah. And the, with improbably, I mean, they would probably need to still farm the back of it, and that makes it difficult for the farmer right. <laughs> right. To, to get in and out. Yeah. But that, you could get comps, I mean get an idea from an appraiser on that. I mean, I don't think we have to worry about commercial development. I don't think we have to worry about industrial or commercial development in that area. I don't think we have to worry about it from, certainly from 235 East. Not, not anytime soon, I don't think. I mean, I don't think there's the, the, the development um, demand right. or the will. So, so it would essentially be the three-acre lots that are already in Bath Township moving towards us That's is what it would be. Thing. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, the reason you want to tie up a Greenbelt or your, whatever land you're targeting for preservation is just that things could change down the road. But um, you, you, know, you want to try to, to move when you get an opportunity so you can lock that in. Does the Jacoby Greenbelt that we're talking about start right at the western edge of our urban service boundary? It does. Yeah. And goes, and how does it go as far as like the <coughs> Houston Road or about how, how many I can, properties? I can do, I, I was not able to, to lay my hands on a good version I could overlay with what's mm -hmm. already preserved. Uh -huh. But it definitely follows that boundary, and I, I can follow up with a map of, of the, um, at least the last depiction of that. I don't think it was actually included in the 2010 update, so I would have to be looking at an earlier version, I think, unless if it was in, and somebody can help me find it, that'd be great. But. Here's, I, I mean, the, are you okay. just wanting to see the creek, or what are you wanting Where to see? Where the, the proposed <laughs> green belt is. Oh. Which properties? I mean, here's the creek, if you want it. Yeah. But the, how far it goes to the west and which properties it is. And I mean, your priority has been along Dayton Yellow Springs. I'm wondering if any of the people uh, any of the other citizens have anything they want to ask of Krista while you're here? I, I have a question. Yeah, Are you know. sensing any pressure from from the um, the uh, cement company moving this way? I know they're not too far away to the west, but they are a little bit farther south. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we have the geology that would support their activities? It, we we may have the geology. I, I yeah I don't know um, how I I'm not understanding that landowners have gotten offers, you know, to my knowledge. Um, I think that there's pretty firm resolve in Miami Township and Yellow Springs to resist that. 
Do we, does Miami Township currently have any mining? Any property that's zoned mining? I don't think so. I don't, I think the only, I, I have to check that to, to be sure, but it seems to me like the only thing that you can do is gravel uh, extraction for on-farm use. And that is mine. I'm pretty sure it's what they, their zoning they need is mining, right? That's mm -hmm. because that's what Xenia Township wouldn't right, give allow, them. wouldn't convert. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in the long run, again, that, that's a consideration too. What do you, you know, if you want to avoid? So, so going back to putting a conservation easement uh, on the properties that are in the green belt, um, the way you figure out what the conservation easement cost is you consider the cost if they would sell those three acre lots as and you would what you 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 would look at though at a the initial sale okay so what would somebody pay who has the intent to sell lots mm -hmm. so you, you 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 know you look at a comparable sale that's happened fairly recently you want to within the last year if at all possible fairly much in the same geography but you're not looking at then how much would that person then in turn make from all of the three acre lots they sold. You would be looking at the sale of the whole piece without any restrictions. Mm -hmm. And then subtract the value as farmland. And then, then you subtract actually the, um, yeah, the, the value as farmland with a conservation easement mm -hmm. limiting it. And there's more and more comparable sales all the time of land with conservation easements. Um, with the Clean Ohio program now, like 14 years of implementation, there's there's pretty many sales to compare it to. And, and when Karen was saying if we wanted to keep the, um, the stream, say we didn't want to resell that, there's are there state and federal programs that would help to? Well, there are. I mean, and actually, if you were thinking about a trail along the stream or something like that, I mean, there would be room to do that. And if you actually purchase the land, then, you know, you just resurvey it and, you know, decide what, how do you want to use that land in the future? It's you'd have that opportunity at that point, and it would be very hard to do that otherwise, you know, when um, there's several landowners along a, a stream corridor. Hmm. Anything else for Krista? I mean, I think, I think the next part of this is to, I mean, you don't necessarily need to stand there for this, but I mean, the next part of this is to, is to decide or to discuss what our next steps are with relation to the infrastructure, um, to and the I'll, CBE. I'll follow up with values and, uh, or estimates. And, okay. The, and then the some kind of a map, map that well. maybe shows a little bit of how you yeah. do that green belt. Okay, cool. Thanks, Thanks. Krista. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Big party for this weekend, huh? You and I both have big parties this weekend. So okay, so that's that's kind of the next step for council to uh, just to discuss. I don't know how much more time we want to spend on it tonight. Um, what direction we want to go. Um, one thing I did ask Patty to do, I kind of alluded to it at the last meeting, is that um, thinking ahead towards this idea of, of doing somewhat of a planning process, somewhat of a charrette process, she did get proposals from um, John Young, our former village manager and planner, and um, Ken LeBlanc from Greene County Regional Planning, seeing those as two people who know Yellow Springs um, and are, are good planners and you know might be able to handle the whole process or handle at least help us with facilitators to, to keep it to keep the planning context. You know, I worry about if we just have mediators or facilitators talking, they're not going to have the planning language. So I think we need a planner at some point leading us through the process. Um, so that's one thing, you know, that's, a, that's one step. I think that's a step that doesn't necessarily, um, that can be independent of the, um, the infrastructure extension. Um, um, I, I, I've been thinking about this and I'm not sure we're, I'd suggest that step before looking at a charrette, which would be 
I mean, as I've been thinking about it, having perhaps a council work session uh, and inviting people from the Planning Commission, the Economic Sustainability Commission, I mean, and the public to just talk about how do we want to move forward in terms of planning. I mean, a charrette is one option. People talk about having a vote. I mean, just a, have some space, the council and people in the community to talk about what does it mean to have community involvement in planning for this property? Um, so I like that. And just to do it as a work session, no decisions made, but just have an opportunity for people to actually talk, not people stand up and say, this is what I want, this is what, I mean, you know, not positional mm -hmm. kind of thing, but just brainstorming, throwing out ideas, people talking about what's important to them. I guess uh, this may sh well show my ignorance, but if um, if the uh, development is likely to happen when there's the impetus is um, a business wants to expand, a business that's already in the village wants to expand. Um, I'm trying to understand how, so I know one issue that I know CR struggled with is the idea that so are, you know, some businesses not feeling they would be in a position to build the building. Um, you know, they felt like they, they wanted something prepared and that, you know, they wanted to be able to rent it or something like that. So that's one kind of question. But the other one is how do we tell, um, how do, uh, if the charrette is to kind of figure out the layout, maybe that's not what a charrette type thing would do if we did a charrette. Um, I mean, how do you do that independent of the business that needs the space? I mean, I guess, so I would, I yeah. I mean, I, mean I, would, I can see, I could see maybe with uh, what Marianne was saying, like for instance, one thing I was thinking I would want to say about it is that it would be integrated into what is a beautiful entryway into the village. And we don't want to, we want to, you know, we want, if there's development out there, that it in, be integrated and that it be beautiful <laughs> and that it not end up being an ugly, you know, ugly parking lot type development. Um, and so how do you do that? So that's kind of a general kind of thing. But how do you, so that's, I don't know. Yeah. Um, that's the problem that I, I don't quite get how we get around that issue because ultimately the cost for the business and are we going to be able to, are there going to be the businesses out there that are actually going to be able to bear the cost? And I guess maybe there's other yeah. fundings. I, I mean, know. it's, yeah, I mean, there are definitely, it's, I'm, yeah, I'm just worried about taking too long and, and losing opportunities. So there was a article in the Dayton Daily News yesterday about a locally owned business by family that happens to live in Yellow Springs, but their business is in Xenia that are looking to expand. And when they came to Yellow Springs 15 years ago, Yellow Springs wasn't interested in them building their building in Yellow Springs. Mm -hmm. And I see us missing an opportunity to bring that business to Yellow Springs because we can't make a decision and we're not ready for um, for this opportunity. So um, I just, you know, I don't know. We can't. I don't know that we can that we can um, make a plan. I mean, I don't know that that makes sense for us to make a plan. I think that. Um, and, and that's why I also think if we get the if we get the infrastructure there, then we've got our, then we can consider opportunities. We don't have to take the opportunity, but at least we wouldn't lose an opportunity. Well, and and my vision of what would come from the charrettes was not so much a plan as the input as to I believe what the citizens are saying they want to see there. Um, you know, perhaps what type of business, whether it be a business at all, because there are some folks who don't want it to be developed, um, but more, a, you know, what type of development, if any, as opposed to a specific plan, because 
most businesses, if in fact they're going to relocate, for instance, this business, um, they're ready to build a new facility. They're going, they're going to build that facility. So then the question would be, you know, do, do they want to purchase the land? Do they want to lease the land? How do they want to go about building that? And, you know, how many acres do they need? So um, normally if a business is ready to expand like that, they can get the funding that they need to do that, no matter how they're going to do it. So my vision of the charrette process and what would come out of it was what would go there, what type of business, whether, whether it would remain farmland, if it's going to be developed, what type of business, uh, which parts of the covenants, uh, perhaps all of them are going to remain in place, that type of thing. That's what I saw coming from the charrettes. It yeah, I, I don't think it's a charrette. Um, and I think, you know, just kind of listening and, and based on what we've been talking about, the key is the community input and understanding that. But, I mean, when we think about the charrette, like the Antioch Village, I mean, you've got a, you've got a specific concept that you're looking right. at. So I, I, I think that's too ambitious for where we're at right now. Well, yeah. So. But I still like the idea of, of having, a, having a planner, a, Sure. Planfulness at the at the root of it. Right. Don, um, can you, you come up? Don Johnson, uh, have you heard anything from the Army Corps of Engineers? Do you know where they are in accepting the uh, the rescoping? It's been signed by the commander just last week. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. I mean, the other thing is when I think about some of the projects where there was just a ton of public input, and I'm, <laughs> I'm for public input, but I know when it comes to development, I mean, remember the, uh, where the hotel was, there was this original plan, uh, affordable housing for elders, um, that Home Inc. was trying to do, and... Well, it started with Friends. Well, it actually, started with Friends. Yeah. Oh, that's right. It started with Friends Care Center. That's right. Um, and there was so much input. I mean, I think it, it killed. It wasn't the whole th reason the project was killed, but I do think. Um, and then, you know, none of that happened with the hotel. There was a concept that, you know, I don't know. It's not that I don't want to see any public input, and especially to some broader issues. But um, I don't think we can have that kind of process if uh, someone's going to, wants to bring a business out there. The, the, public would weigh into everything about that development right. Right. right right but I think it's 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 similar to what is I guess it's what Patty mentioned the covenants and you know it's revisiting yes. those covenants yeah, looking at you know the limitations and the restrictions and um, uh, you know maybe doing a survey of, of existing businesses and what are their needs and and things like that so you know that's what that's part of you know mm -hmm. staff Denise and 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 um, Patty could probably structure something that, um, and that might actually even even get some help from um, from Ken LeBlanc possibly. Right, I don't and, and I believe Ken mentioned something like that. I didn't you know, I mean, and, and he conversation. And we are that. members of Green County Regional Planning, right. so there is a certain level of service that they do provide us um, and assistance. Right. Yeah, I, I would go back to, you know, the process that we had related to local policing that the HRC facilitated with mediation seems to me like this next step that we've been talking about, that I've heard citizens talking about. That is a way to look at priorities. That's a way to, you know, get a lot of small group interaction. Um, and then we see where that takes us. That's my recommendation. Chris? The council, it seems to me, is talking about you know the concepts of the type of economic development that you would maybe consider. I think what's also important for the villagers to, to understand as well is the, the legal process that would have to occur in the context of opportunities for villagers to communicate what their concerns are or their support for a given project may be, which is that any effort to develop, uh, for example, the CBE property would have to go through planning commission. There will be public notices of what the intent is, there will be opportunity for citizens input, and whatever the planning commission hears then ultimately will make its way to council. So in, in that context of the, the legal process, 
of what might happen with the property. There's going to be other layers of public input once there may be a concrete idea in place. And so when you're discussing this, because the citizens are very concerned about having their voice heard, it will be in another part of that process once there's something that's actually maybe on the table for discussion. So I'm not sure that we've really talked about that as a group. And again, I think it's important that, that everyone recognize how that will happen. But I, I think we need, maybe it's what Brian is suggesting. I think we need place, place, a place, places for people to say what their fears are, what they want before it gets to planning. I mean, because if something comes to planning commission and people are upset about it, that's not when we need to have and that. And I'm not but suggesting that, that, before that I'm simply saying understanding that, that generally that any discussions that happen now, there's still a legal process that will occur after that fact that will include further opportunities for input from villagers who want to communicate on whatever that idea is. In addition to In addition to, exactly. I also like the, but I like the idea of you of including planning commission, um, the economic sustainability commission, potentially even the township and the schools, because they will all. I mean, we're, we're talking especially about economic development that will impact the schools potentially more than anybody. Um, so, um, you know, I think that I like the idea of a. You know, I mean, that's a lot. To, that's a lot to schedule. It's a lot to work around. But you know, maybe we at least invite representatives. We don't expect the entire school board and the entire township trustee group to be there to be here, but invite representatives or something. Is there another step relative to you know? We had the first reading on the ordinance, and then we. I don't think we had a reading, did we? We, we just tabled. Are, are we talking it? about the draft resolution? resolution? Yeah. I think we tabled it. Right. The draft resolution for the yeah, I mean the, the Eight Street, Street yeah. extension. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess my question was: Is there any further discussions we need to have before that we bring that back? That question back. You're talking about the RFP resolution. Yes. Um, I, I think we're ready to bring it back. I don't need any more. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. So sh we'll put that on the agenda. We'll we'll put that on future agenda items for the next meeting. Don has her hand up. Excuse me. Oh, Don. Sorry. Go I'm ahead. Sorry. Could I, you? I have one question. This is um, in regard to uh, what Christopher was saying. Now, there's already a subdivision there, and a while back. Uh, in the, and maybe things have changed since then. Council allowed um, a site plan review to be to happen internally if the lots already existed. So would there still be a legal process then? Well, there will always be a, a legal process in the sense that there's going to be an opportunity because something has to be approved. Um, and I think that if there's not, given the sensitivity of the subject, I would think there's options for allowing community input where there may not one bill in the process. Uh, I can't specifically answer your question because I'm not familiar with the history of that part of the okay. But three lots and the two streets or three streets are what's being transferred back to the village or what's being transferred the, to the, the entire parcel. Oh, yeah. The entire parcel. Three parcels or yeah. one? The, the entire the entire property. It's right. it's three prop right. it's three parcels plus the road uh, paper roadways is what she's asking. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. You know, I think, Chris, something that would be good for us to understand, I'm not sure when, um, is what, ha and Dawn has asked this in the past, is um, the status of those covenants with the transfer of the land. Do those covenants go with the property? And, you know, what other, what other means and mechanisms we might have to put those kinds of similar restrictions on the kind of development that happens there? Was a general rule covenants run with the land, so whatever is there okay. would be transferred okay. with it. Mm. Okay. Okay, are we ready to move on? Yeah. We have two gentlemen sitting here that I think want to hear what we're going to talk about. Downtown bicycle parking. Um, Patty, are you going to take this one? I am going to take okay. this one. Okay. Um, as we previously discussed, um, Jason and his crew installed a, a um, bike corral on Short Street at Xenia. Um, we would like to propose moving that um, 
over to the yellow curbed um, area, and I think there's a picture, there was a picture in there, um, the yellow curbed area in front of unfinished creations. And there is also in uh, your packet a picture of a uh, uh, bike corral kit that we intend to purchase with donated funds um, to put in that location. Um, this was the location that was initially suggested and discussed, but we had concerns about, number one, the paving going through there. We, we didn't want to do it prior to the paving. Uh, and number two, we had some concerns with ODOT, which I think Jason has uh, gotten cleared up. So what we'd like to propose is moving the bike corral, taking it off of Short Street and making that a parking space again, but moving this over to the yellow curved area in front of Unfinished Creations. It's not a parking space, so it won't take up any parking spaces. We would install this new type of bike corral, this kit that is in your packets, um, and it would, uh, it would be installed over there on the east side of Xenia, right there in front of Unfinished Creations. And I know that Eric Oberg and Chris Mongiorno are both here, um, and they are both supportive of this. If you gentlemen would like to come up and speak to that. Thank you, Patty. Um, just a couple, a couple things I'd like to point out. Thank you for considering this. Um, I want to thank the village for moving on this. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of communities I work in that talk about this and talk about this and talk about this and talk about this. Um, so I'm really happy to see we actually, you know, there's one out there now for us to look at. I think this will be a great improvement to the one that's out there now. Um, a couple points I want to make uh, because I hear, I mean, we all hear what people's reactions are uh, regardless of how you hear it or see it, whether it's social media or just on the street talking to people. Uh, positive and negative reactions to the existing one. Um, a couple things I heard was, boy, there's, every time I see it, there's only one or two bikes there. What's the point? And, and I kind of, I'd like to make the point that those one or two bikes could easily be one or two cars. And if it was two cars, it'd be taking up twice the amount of space that that one did. So I think each villager has the right to park downtown. And if they're using a bike, they're taking up a lot less space. So if we're seeing one bike there, that easily could be one car. And that one person has every right to that space as if they were a driver. So I'm not as concerned as seeing 20 bikes there. If we see one or two, that person has every right to have that space. Um, the other thing, I, I, I found it interesting, um, about two weeks ago when I was downtown, a really nice uh, Saturday morning, and the, the only bike parking that we can actually see downtown, if you were a visitor that was plopped in the middle of downtown, you, you would notice the two inverted U's maybe uh, on Short Street there by the hardware store, and you might notice the one at Tom's. Uh, and there were, pro there were more than a dozen bikes at the one at Tom's. And only two of them were on the rack because that style of rack doesn't actually fit a bike. If you try to put a adult sized front <laughs> wheel in that, it won't fit. Um, so part of the reason you may not see many bikes in those racks is because your bike doesn't actually fit in that rack. Uh, and so there was about 10 bikes parked on either side of Tom's uh, bike rack and two bikes parked on the end because that's the only place you actually can put an adult sized bike in those racks. Um, so we'll have proper bike parking downtown. It will be prominent bike parking, which I also think is important. We have a culture of bike friendliness in Yellow Springs, but if you plop a visitor downtown and they look around, what do they actually see that says that? We know it's a great place to ride because we live here, but a visitor may not. And we don't really have anything explicitly telling people, this is a great place for you to ride other than our reputation. So I think a prominently placed bike corral says a little bit about our values as a community as well. So um, I, I think this is a fairly, uh, a fairly inexpensive and really a, a really nice addition to downtown. I think it says something about who we are and I think it's an, equi an equitable thing as well. People deserve an upfront parking space whether they're using a car or a bike, right? Um, we don't want, I don't think cyclists should be put off to the side. And right now, you know, we're, uh, it, this will just be nice. I'll stop there. I think it's a great amenity. I think it's fairly simple. We alleviate, I, I did hear some concern about it taking a parking space. The, this, uh, this space being proposed doesn't do that, so it takes away that, uh, that concern. Um, also where it's going couldn't be a parking space anyway. Currently there is light posts, there are the, uh, um, trash cans there so even if we wanted to turn that yellow curb into a parking space it wouldn't work anyway so it really is a perfect place for bike parking. Chris, do you want to say something? Thank you Eric and thank you everyone for your support of this project. I really don't have much to add um, to what Eric said. No that's okay. Um, I'll just add to that we are um, 
members of a uh, voluntary citizen uh, transportation group called the Active Transportation Committee. Um, we submitted a letter to council in May and uh, talked about a few things that we would like to see happen alongside the repaving of Route 68. And so far, we're taking those things off. Uh, the Continental Crosswalks are in, which is great. So thank you to everyone for working on that project and improving the profile of our um, high volume pedestrian crosswalks. Um, and this is another key part of that, was dedicating an on-street space on Xenia Avenue in a high profile location um, for people to park their bikes, get those bikes off of the trees, off of railings, put them into a proper um, a secure bike parking location. Um, I have heard some feedback even on this rack that there's some opportunities to upgrade it with signage. We would love to be a part of that. Um, Eric and I and, and the rest of the committee would be happy to be a part of um, adding some signage, whether standard uh, off the rack um, MUTCD signage or something with a local flair. Because I do think that what you see here, while it is functional, um, it does need a little bit of explaining. And I think we could increase the profile of this uh, new amenity downtown with some, some better signage. Uh, and I think, too, that we're uh, on board for doing some public outreach, whether it be via the local news um, or even standing out there with the rack on, on a Saturday um, and welcoming people to use it so that they understand. Uh, Eric and I had an experience, actually, after we met with you guys last time, we were out there with two people trying to lock up to the bike corral and not really getting it. And, uh, you know, just a five-minute conversation, you, you can share a lot of information. So um, we're here to answer any questions. As is you that this. the footprint you're looking at, and what for what you're proposing, and how? What is the width of that? The footprint that we think is reasonable is about an eight foot depth, which is a slightly smaller uh, profile than the existing parking bay. Um, I think we have is it nine foot parking lanes? So we could we could do this in an eight foot space. Um, so that's curb to the yellow vertical bollards. Um, so a little bit narrower than a parking space. And then it could be between 16 and 20 feet long. You could actually double that. You could add as many racks as you want. In this space, I think 16 to 20 feet would be adequate okay. for the number of racks. Jason, do you know how long that's, how, what the whole yellow well, curb is? You don't want to get, what we talked about, I mean, you don't want to get too far up to the um, crosswalk. Right, yes, that's yes. what I'm saying. I want to, I want yes. to keep it a little bit smaller. Yes. What, what this, will do is perfectly fit within that parking space and still allow for maneuverability around those signs. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how are you, how are, do you see the bikes feeding in? So that's a fair question. The way that these are designed, the off the rack version, um, and, and as my pre preference would be to, uh, I'm, I'm a vehicular cyclist, I'm riding in off of the, the drive lane and I pull right into the angled bike rack. Um, but we have heard some concerns about um, people not feeling comfortable heading in from the drive lane and heading out into the drive lane directly. So there's there's an opportunity to, again, with the signage, encourage people to get off their bikes at the crosswalk and walk their bike up the sidewalk into the rack if we decide that we would rather close off the, uh, the drive lane side of this. And we've looked at some examples. Um, Karen actually sent some pictures from Ann Arbor of a rack uh, corral in the street in Ann Arbor where they actually put up banners on the street side to again mm -hmm. increase the visibility and say a nice message about you know, Ann Arbor is is a bicycle friendly city. We could do the same sort of thing here and that way better buffer off the drive lane. I think we can go either way and I'm I'm open to helping with either one. And if I understood it in the write up, it would be removed uh, when we determine it's the, the winter period for possible snow, yeah, and right. then put back up in the spring. Um, and as I'm looking at the, the picture, I can see the the, the two bumpers. The, the other parts would would we have to drill into the street to anchor those? Or the, the bollards I've been in contact with ODOT, and they're kind of on the fence. They don't want a big permanent bollard there and, and that's what we've discussed mm. um, the bumpers they don't mind so much as long as they're removed mm -hmm. for snow right no snow removal but the bollards are the, the big sticking point so we're still kind of ironing those out but at the same time we've already put in and, and placed the order for them okay so now are they they level so. with the uh, the road surface or do they when you remove them when we remove yes. them oh sure yes yeah. everything should be surface level okay okay yeah. and, and are each of those 
each of the U's, are the, each of those in independently or can they be racked together so that you only have to literally like maybe take out a couple sets of screws? I think it's just a couple sets of screws. But for each right. one, each individual one? There's, there's, or a, is, long, there's a long piece of, of iron that runs along the bottom. Right. So they are connected. Are, yeah, okay, yes. so that's easier. Yes. And that makes okay. them more sturdy and then it, right. yes. it reduces the right. amount of uh, right. fixtures yeah. you have in the ground. Right, okay. Yeah. So this type of bollard does go into a hole or not? It does, right. Okay, so then we could just put a cover over it, right? And if, if ODOT says that we can do that, yes. Okay. Yeah, there are definitely different uh, fixture styles where you could have uh, just anchor bolts and then they could come out with a quick release. But, you know, those things get gummed up. So um, I'm going refer to defer to you on how to make it work because um, you're the one that's kind of yeah. responsible for it when it cover might be comes. scraped off by yeah. The, yeah. think yeah, about we, the snow plow yeah we, I don't know. we no. discussed that a little bit Jason and I did about you know because it does have to be pretty much flat with the right. with the road service I mean your plows up a little bit but it's not up you know enough it, mm -hmm. it, it would lift out anything that it kept caught the lip up mm -hmm. so Jason and I had a little bit of a discussion about how to plug the holes and keep the stuff out of it for the winter, but we haven't quite figured that out yet. Well, the bad thing is that the state runs metal plates, right. so yeah. whatever they is, it's going it's to do some damage to so. Well, it's likely those holes are going to get filled anyway. Certainly over the winter, I would I would expect you're probably going to have to drill them out again in the spring. I mean, spring. we had that hole right, you know, in front of uh, the gas station forever in the road, so, um, and it didn't have any purpose. Okay. So I guess the question is, is council amenable to us moving that? And it would, Jason has to take the current one out for street fare anyway, because that space is used. So what would happen is as soon as he gets the other one in, he'd just put it back in the new location and make the short street of parking okay. space again. So if everyone's amenable to that, we'll, we'll move in that direction. Yeah, I think it's great. And Excellent. I do want to say, I've seen plenty of times where the current rack is full. Especially on the weekends, and that's when we're a surprise because those. I mean, it I know, isn't it, a yeah, friendly rack. I, it, you're right, and that's why I was shocked to see. I take a picture of most every day. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah, Thank good. you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh oh. Budget. I guess that's why all these guys are sitting back yeah, here. Yeah, that's why yeah. all the staff Look are like they're asleep. Here. Can I just ask one quick question? Sure. The complete streets uh, policy. Was this just in here? I wanted to. I I put that in because I okay. we had said that we'd yes. get something in there. Um, and I do think we should uh, make it a discussion topic in the future. Um, you know, one of the things that I think was referenced before is you do get points for having a complete streets policy, you know, in terms of uh, funding from NVRPC and, and other entities. Um, so, yeah, but I thought it would be kind of a, we look at it now and then we talk about it more and see how it would make sense for us. I like that idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, Melissa, we're moving on to budget, enterprise, special revenue, and capital funds. Okay, so I am going to try to keep this as succinct as possible um, so that everybody stays awake. Hmm. So I have actually four sections to present tonight. The first that I want to discuss are the special revenue funds budgets. and. I did format this a bit differently than what I presented the general fund. Uh, normally I condense uh, the version presented to council um, so that each individual line is not shown um, in the expenditures, but it is in the revenues um, just because I, the revenue sources are, are much, uh, much more limited versus the expenditure lines, um, which are more numerous. So we'll start with the special revenue funds. And what, just to, just to give a little overview, um, what makes a special revenue fund is uh, the, the sources of revenue that, um, that fund these, um, each of these uh, departments are earmarked. So um, like the streets fund uh, receives some money from gasoline and motor vehicle, gasoline taxes and motor vehicle licenses. 
Parks and Rec, um, we receive money from uh, program receipts. Um, and, you know, some of the other funds are very specifically sourced, um, which is why each of them are their own fund and they are classified as a special revenue fund. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and jump in. So the first one that I would like to talk about is the Street Maintenance and Repair Fund. Um, this is one of the larger uh, budgets uh, when it comes to special revenue funds, that along with the Parks Fund. The Street Maintenance and Repair Fund um, has two different um, so-called departments within it, Streets, which is the main department, and then we also have the Safe Routes to School um, project, which is rolling up into the Street Maintenance and Repair Fund. So if we take a look at the revenues, um, the revenues that are received um, by the gasoline taxes, permissive taxes, and the motor vehicle licenses, um, which are those, those top lines there, as you'll see, they're very minimal and they stay relatively flat. Um, they, they don't really fluctuate all that much. And as you see, we are set for uh, 2017 to receive an estimated $123,000. So as you all are aware, as of the last uh, budget presentation, that's not enough to be able to support the entire uh, streets fund. So we do uh, make up for that with a transfer in, uh, which you'll see that the transfer in for 2017 is only marked to be uh, 238,723. Um, that's down from 2016, uh, which the transfer was 524. And if you look at the two years prior, um, they were they were much more than what's uh, marked for 2017. And as we talked about in uh, the last budget presentation, when we discussed uh, transfers as part of the general fund, um, this is a direct result of um, fiscal conservancy as well as uh, capital projects being at, um, actually there are no capital projects for 2017, I think, that are marked at this point. Um, for the streets fund. So um, this is basically just operational um, costs. So um, 361898 are the total revenues for the streets fund. So if we look at the different departments, as you'll notice, um, what I was talking about earlier is you'll see the um, each of the categories uh, listed instead of each of the individual lines. So these are, these are similar among all of the departments, uh, personnel services, general operating expenses, which is just travel and training, contractual services, materials and supplies, capital, debt service, which are any loans that we have, um, and then miscellaneous. So if we look at the expenses for streets, they are uh, totaled out at $557,191, which is uh, much less than what was budgeted in 2016. So. And then if we take a look at the uh, Safe Routes to School, we have had some um, expenditures in 2016, um, which have been some of the um, right-of-way acquisition consulting costs, which we will be set to receive back from ODOT. Um, I do not have those coming into the revenues at this point because it's still unclear when we might receive the, that funding, if it's in 2016 or if it's in 2017. So if you look at the very bottom line of the street, um, the streets fund, um, I have the uh, revenue over or under expenditures. And you'll see that we are dipping in a little bit um, because I like to just maintain uh, four months worth of operating as a uh, reserve for our special revenue funds. Um, as I had discussed last time, um, I'd rather not move too much money into those special revenue funds and leave them in the general fund so that we do have that flexibility with those dollars. So this will leave the uh, four months worth of operating uh, left in reserves for the streets fund after all of our expenditures in 2017. Does anybody have any questions with streets? Okay. So are we doing any paving? Paving is already folded in into okay. professional services. Okay which is actually, I'm sorry, contractual, contractual services. services. Okay. It's the professional services line, but it's in contractual services. So yes, that is where the paving okay. would come from. Yeah, I, I think I'm missing something because this is showing almost 200,000 uh, uh, expenses over income. What? Yeah. The red line on the bottom. Yes. And, and that's, uh, that's totally appropriate because 
we had some savings from 2016. Um, oh, okay, so it's not showing what the fund is total? Um, it, if you look at the second page, somehow it managed to squeak, um, squeak by on the second page. Oh. At the end yes, of 2017, okay, we you. should have 142,000 yeah. left, right. and that's leaving us right where we should be for okay, four months of you. operating. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on to the State Highway Maintenance Fund. This one's uh, super easy. Um, this is uh, where other gas, the other uh, portion of gasoline and motor vehicle license taxes go. Um, this is seven and a half percent of the gasoline and um, motor vehicle licenses that we receive. So those stay relatively flat as well. Um, expected to receive about ten thousand dollars, and we have no expenditures in that area. So then we'll move on to the Parks and Recreation Fund. Um, this is the, the second uh, largest uh, fund, special revenue fund. And most of the receipts that we receive um, in, this, in this fund are from uh, program receipts. So that includes the uh, swimming pool admissions, concessions, any rental that we receive from uh, the Bryan Center. Um, and we also have uh, some donations that come into this, but they're minimal. So. The rest of that is made up for as a transfer in and uh, parks. There really isn't a whole lot that's done in parks, so this this transfer isn't significantly less than what it has been in the past. Actually, it's about two thousand dollars more than what it was in 2016. So the total revenues for parks and recreation are two hundred ninety-eight thousand six hundred eighty-six. And parks actually has several different departments within it. There's the Parks Department, there's Pool, there's the Bryan Center, and then there's Bryan Youth Center. So if we take a look at the totals for each of those, um, each of these departments are set to spend uh, less than what they were budgeted for in 2016. Um, parks were set to spend $61,582. The Pool, $102,175. Which, if you look at uh, the pool, which I think is interesting, this is the first year that um, we had taken it back under our management versus uh, contracting it out. And uh, we did save a little bit um, versus when it was contracted out in 2015. Um, but we did spend a little bit more than uh, what we did in 2014. But it is important to note that so much of this is weather dependent. Um, at least when we have the pool um, contracted uh, or managed internally versus contracted out, if there's a rainy day or bad weather um, or the potential for thunderstorms, we would see those uh, savings directly as we're not paying those staff versus when we had it contracted out. We paid no matter if they were there or not. Um, and then the Bryan Center is set, set to spend just uh, slightly less than what was budgeted in 2016. And then the Youth Center, they keep a relatively flat budget of $5,000, so that has stayed the same. So total parks and revenue are dipping into their uh, reserves a little bit by uh, 61000 approximately, leaving uh, 115000 which is actually the four months of operating, which I like to keep in there. Any question about parks? Why is the projected revenue for the pool lower in 2017? Um, what I what I typically do with all of the budgets is I I tend to be conservative on the revenue side by um, estimating possibly a little bit less because we had a really good year um, in 2016. The weather was great. We hardly had any rainy cold days. The weather was almost perfect. Mm -hmm. um, I've been calc I've been bringing in the pool receipts um, for well this was my third full year of bringing in pool receipts and every day was consistent this year and that has not happened um, in the last few years but mm. that's the weather was perfect this year so I we can't bank on that every single year unfortunately well and if you look at what she's actually projecting at this point that we end up with in 2016 it's 101,000 and she's projecting 102 for next year so yeah I'm, I'm talking about the uh, revenues but yeah oh, okay yeah I mean oh, it's off by 10,000 yeah, Pat, yeah. Patty was looking at I mean, the I yeah. situation be conservative no I think that I, I was just curious what, what yeah I I tend to I tend to um, undershoot revenue slightly and I overshoot expenditure slightly. Mm -hmm. yep. That's usually how I operate. Um, any other questions with parks? 
Okay. Um, Economic Development Fund at this point um, is still unused to my knowledge. Um, the, let's see, Economic Development Administrative uh, Administration budget has been unused for quite some time as well. Um, green space, um, we talked about this with the uh, transfers in which all of the transfers into the capital improvement budgets were lower, which we'll discuss that again um, now that the whole budget will have been presented when we come back around to the next council meeting. So we've got 5,000 going in now, but we do have room to be able to change that once we look at um, the budget overall um, and everything's been presented. Um, we don't have any indication that there are any expenses in 2017 out of the Green Space Fund. So that, with that um, addition to the Green Space Fund, we'll have um, about $200,000 in that budget uh, total for Green Space. Okay, if we look at the Motor Vehicle License Permissive Tax Fund, um, this again is relatively flat. We bring in about $25,000. We don't have any expenditures marked to come out of this. Um, in 2015, we did buy some backup batteries um, for some street lights, which was one of the first times that we touched any of that fund in quite some time. So we don't have anything earmarked for 2017. I, I do want to ask real quick, Johnny, are all the battery backups on all of the lights now? They're on all the traffic signals. Okay. Right. <laughs> Uh, the uh, next fund is the uh, Mayor's Court Computer Fund. This is a very small fund uh, where we do get minimal amount of money that comes in from fines costs, um, and it just covers the Mayor's Court Computer Software Program. So it's a relatively uh, clean in and out there. We have the Law Enforcement and Education Fund. This fund uh, barely brings in any money. Um, it's a little bit of money that comes in from Xenia that's earmarked law enforcement and education, um, about $50 a year, so it's very minimal. Um, that fund has about $5,200 in it, should we ever uh, find any kind of a need that we could use for that, um, but there's nothing in 2017 that's marked. With the all the educational programs that Chief has been doing, are we do we take the money so we don't take the money out of that to do the training that all the officers are doing? We haven't yet, but we could. So it's just coming out of his general fund, Correct. his general budget? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. And then we have the Coats and Supplies Fund, which um, has built up a little bit. Um, going into uh, 2017, we should have about $13,000. Um, so that's the uh, program that is ran by the police department that takes the uh, Mills Lawn children out to uh, buy coats and uh, winter supplies each year um, and that's that money is all received through donation and then we have federal forfeited assets which um, was formerly known as the um, oh gosh now I can't even remember what we Justice. used to call it just, just yeah it used to be called the FOJ fund um, which was incorrectly classified for a number of years because it had federal and state money commingled which is a big no-no so um, federal money, uh, it's dwindled down with the purchases that uh, were made this year. Um, Chief had bought a little bit of equipment out of that fund, and I can't remember off the top of my head what it was, but that'll leave $122 in that fund, so it's pretty much depleted at this point. And that's not anything that we can expect to receive money from because that kind of happens on a case-by-case -case basis. The next, uh, the next fund is the uh, State Law Enforcement Trust Fund, which was the state half of the FOJ fund. Um, this was money that we were regularly receiving from the um, Greene County ACE Task Force. Since that money um, you know, hasn't really been flowing in anymore, um, we received a little bit of money from forfeitures in 2016 to the tune of $3,200. I don't budget for revenues because those come from um, cases that we're directly involved with, which we can't necessarily plan for. Um, so we've got about 71000 in that fund, and uh, we marked another 10000 to be spent for uh, materials and supplies for the police department again in uh, 2017. And the last of the special revenue funds is the police pension fund. A uh, portion of our real estate and um, our real estate taxes come into this 
and there was an increase in real estate taxes that was listed in the general fund and after talking with the auditor I had um, I had overshot um, that by placing all of it into the general fund and uh, not earmarking the particular portion for the police pension fund so that was where some of that overage came from so the police pension fund receives a portion of um, real estate taxes and um, actually the 2016 projected uh, we'd already received everything for the year so that should be marked 26,830 versus the 40,000 that's listed I didn't update that formula so I will change that and um, this actually uh, pays for all of the full-time officers pensions so there is a uh, an $85,000 transfer set to come in from the general fund to make up the rest of those pensions that the uh, property taxes do not uh, fully support. And then uh, you see the expenditures um, of $115,450. So I try to balance that where the revenues match the expenditures and it's an even in and out. So that is it for the special revenue funds. A lot of very small funds in that, so it just takes a little bit to get through. Any questions with those? Okay, the next uh, the next one is relatively easy. This is capital projects and debt service funds, which we should just rename to capital projects because we no longer have any debt service funds. Uh, the Bryan Center bond used to be part of that, which was a debt service fund. So basically what you're going to see here is going to tie into what we see <coughs> with the general fund and what we will see uh, to follow with the enterprise funds which are the transfers into these capital improvement funds that we started doing last year. Um, we don't have anything coming into water uh, yet because there's so many uh, large projects happening with water that I don't feel comfortable moving anything into that until we know exactly what all of our debt service payments are going to be for the new water plant um, and see where we're at. So we don't have anything coming into water capital yet. Um, but most of our facilities will be new, so um, hopefully we don't need much in terms of capital improvements uh, after the next couple of years. So we have sewer capital improvement. We've got 50000 coming into that, no expenses. Um, electric capital improvement, we've got 50000 coming in. We will be spending 115000 out of that fund, um, which we can talk about um, in the capital budget. Um, but it's an infrared camera and power pole change outs. So the camera is 15,000 and the power pole change outs are 100,000. So we have those expenses coming out of that fund. And then if we flip over to the Parks and Recreation Improvement Fund, we've got a transfer in of 12,500, no expenses there. Facilities Improvement Fund, another 12,500. Um, and then we've got $12,000 worth of expenses coming out of that, and that is coming from um, library handrails, um, which were just added in as an expense on that side. So, um, And then we have the capital equipment fund, um, $12,500 coming in, no expenses. So we've got um, approximately 137,500 uh, coming into revenue for those capital improvement funds, and then we're spending about um, 127,000 out of that. So, any questions on capital projects and debt service funds? Which we'll still go over the capital budget, which is minimal, but I hit most of it in this. I just had a question about um, the needs of the pool. Um, it's a general question. <laughs> Just we, we used to talk about this years ago about sort of the shape of the pool and the eventual great expenses. So I'm just curious. Have you guys been talking about this while I was off the well, council? Well, last year we What's painted the pool and what else did we do? Um, we did Jason? Some? We got, uh, we refurbed the pump that's up there. Um, we bought new chemical pumps. Um, so next year it will be very, very minimal. Is the pool in, I mean, if the pool is kept up, can it just, I mean, it's it should last for a long time. It's in a, it's in a, a lot better shape than when we took it back from the pool maintenance, I would say that. Um, uh -huh. Our filters, we spent a lot of money on our filters, and the filters were damaged. Um, they weren't cleaned properly. Huh. Um, our pump was not cleaned properly as well. 
So that's the five grand that we had to do that. Um, we bought new valves. Um, we've replaced the catwalk. We've, we've done a lot to the pool. So um, next year. So as long as we keep it up, it should last as as, forever. As long as we keep a, a hold on it, I think we should be okay. Okay. Um, yeah. But bringing it back in house, I think that, that you know the conversation is definitely there between Sam and I, and um, you know she knows our stuff and she's kept me in the loop. So I think we're getting ahead of the game, so mm -hmm. to speak, when something's getting ready to go bad. I mean, mm -hmm. We had one baby bull pump that went bad, but you can't forecast that. Mm -hmm. So good. <laughs> so I guess while we're on the topic, we can go ahead and take a look at the capital budget before we get into the final piece, which is the enterprise funds. Um, the capital budget is uh, separated out into uh, funds. The general fund, which uh, we already discussed uh, last uh, meeting, uh, the police department had requested a cruiser uh, for $40,000 in 2017. And then uh, the other three items that are listed as part of the general fund in the capital budget are all PD-related items. Mm -hmm. Um, for the next four years after 2017. So those are items to, to plan for. Um, the special revenue funds, uh, the only thing that we have is in streets. We have a uh, new truck for streets and sewer collection listed to be in 2018, which we've been in discussion about uh, whether or not to put that in 2017 or 2018. So those discussions are continuing. Um, those, those were happening up until Thursday of last week when the packet had to get to Judy. Uh, and do you, I know, I know that Jason, um, one of the reasons that Jason is here tonight is because he um, had some pictures of the truck that he's requesting to move from 2018 to, into 2017. Um, it is a, uh, Jason, why don't you explain? It's a 2008 um, Dodge 3500. Um, the issue is that um, this truck is deteriorating rather quickly because of the salt. Um, it, when you pull it up, you can see the salt corrosion in the bed itself. It's got plenty of pinholes in the bed. The bed is not the issue. It's the safety of the truck itself. Um, when I sent it to Key Chrysler, they said that it was going to be about $59.99 um, worth of fixes that need to be replaced. Uh, there's no muffler on this thing. The brakes are bad. The brakes were worn so bad that it's worn grooves in the calipers. Um, it's a Dodge diesel truck, um, and it, it doesn't really benefit us driving around in town because it has an emissions filter. And if you don't take it out periodically and run it at um, highway speeds, that filter will clog, and that's what's happened. So it needs a new filter as well. Um, numerous electrical issues, um, but that $5,906,000 is to get it back just to operational. It's not going to get it to brand new. I, I mean, even if spending that money, I can't say if it's going to be a week or two years down the road, but we will have to look at putting more money into this truck. Um, and I've got some maintenance logs, and currently, to the date, we have put about $5,200 into this truck. If we put that extra six grand in there, we'll go over $11,000. This, this year? No, 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 no. Since we, since we oh, purchased since it in 2008. Gotcha. Yes. And that is not counting numerous oil changes that we have provided ourselves. So the, so the question is, because Melissa will have to know when she brings back the final budget, do we want to move that truck into the 2017 budget. Jason, does that include tires also? Yes, it includes tires as well. Um, we've fixed uh, three tires on this, um, two alternators, um, and then the rest is, is just like glow plugs and, and um, you know, taking it back in because the uh, exhaust filter has been full. Now the the bed. Do we do we put something else in there in the winter to hold our salt and so forth? Or this bed is actually was for a smaller V box spreader. 
uh, which has uh, since gone bad, but we right. cannot. You can't put. We can't haul anything. We can't haul salt in it. I mean, if Judy can panel through some pictures, the, the holes are in the end. Inside. Yes. Yeah. I'm not sure so we can't really bed. use it. Oh, is that That's a nice picture. <laughs> I'm not sure I have the bed of the truck. Okay, Casey. there's some. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's the problem. There are kids green eating green things in, in the bed of the truck. <laughs> and, and how much are we talking oh, yeah. about having to put the move back? I I, I forgot to for open up for the pass. cost of the truck itself. Yeah, the the truck is twenty two out of streets and twenty two out of uh, sewer collection. Sewer collection. Sewer collection. Yeah. Okay. Coming out of different funds. No, I will go a step further and, and tell council that the, the truck that I'm proposing to get is a aluminum bed and chassis truck so it'll be more susceptible you know to knock rust um, but there will be a plow on it for for doing small areas and cul-de-sacs and such um, and it will be a gasoline will not be using it. so we'll eliminate the, the exhaust filter issues and for 2017, I already got that number. It, it comes in closer to 31, 32 instead of 44. Plus, 40, the, plus the plow? The, the 44 is covering the plow and everything else that we need to do. Lettering, plow, everything else. That's a brand new. Yes, ma'am. 2017. Will it be another Dodge or? It's a Ford F2. Okay. Thank you. So, thoughts? Oh, not too many. Yeah, given this, I think we should move it to 17 and not take the chance. It's just, to me, it's just throwing money down the dirt hole. <coughs> we keep trying to repair it. When yeah, we, when I agree really can't that. use it for much. <laughs> so, put it in the budget. Okay. Sorry. All right, so then uh, the only other thing with streets is there is a uh, another field truck with a plow slated for 2020 um, with half coming out of uh, streets again and the other half coming out of sewer collection. Um, electric capital improvement, we covered that. Um, an infrared camera this year and power pole change outs for a total of 115,000, 500 or 115,000 even. Um, and then in uh, facilities capital improvement, we got those library handrails this year for 12,000. Um, and there are also two other uh, items marked for the library, but are farther out. Windows in 2020 and then ADA restrooms in 2021. Um, those two are pretty large ticket items, which we need to, uh, to make sure that we're uh, conscious of and we're able to uh, save money towards those uh, two larger projects. Um, and then what we also have marked for 2017 is the Sutton Farm crew quarters. I did not fold this anywhere into the budget because uh, we're still unsure as to how that could be funded, where that might come from. I know that there's been lots of conversation about the sale proceeds from Sutton Farm and uh, what we might do with those monies. So we, we are going to uh, plan to move ahead with the project in 2017, but uh, funding that will still, uh, we'll still have further discussions about that as uh, time, time draws uh, near. Did that pole building ever get built? They're, they're, uh, they've got all the poles up and the uh, half of the walls are halfway up on the bracing. Part, part of the problem they ran into was when they started digging the, the pole uh, the, the, for the poles and the supports. They kept running into trash that entire place. I, I dug down nine foot was still hitting uh, trash. Yeah, so yeah. As in, as in car number. seats and. So we had to switch wow. back to the other yeah. side, and then we hit it on twelve of the yeah. pole locations, and we had to go seven feet on them versus the four feet that we planned on. Yeah, yeah that, that's the good news is it's going up. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that entire place used to be a dump. Yeah, years ago when we we did our own. Uh, we had our own trash collect collection. That's what we done. So, with the crew quarters, are we going to have it bid? Are we going to do a, a more standard process of? Well, we actually have 
a design that they have from before um, that we can bid bid out. Um, the the only question is, like Melissa said, where is it going to come from? And and you know, this is I'll throw this out just so everybody can think about it. There are two possibilities to fund it. One is to use the proceeds from Sun Farm. The other is to take it from the general fund. What Melissa and I have discussed is using the proceeds from Sutton Farm to fund the crew quarters, but having the money in the general fund in case something comes up that we need to transfer it into green space. And the reason that we say that is because taking the, the crew quarters out of the general fund will very d deeply deplete the reserves in the general fund. So we have the ability to cover it if something comes up immediately for, for green space that we need. But at the same time, if nothing comes up, we won't have depleted the general fund um, and we would use the money from the sale to fund the crew quarters. And we do have $200,000 in right. the green space fund as it is. Right. And so, you know, if we use the money from the sale of Sutton to, to fund the crew quarters and we just leave what's in the general fund there, that way it's not depleted. But if something does come up and we need to transfer that money, it's there and council can do it with a supplemental appropriation. It's, 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 not, a, it's not a huge deal. Um, but at least that way we've not depleted the general fund and I think Melissa, mm -hmm. I know I would feel more comfortable yeah. and I think Melissa would too. But the, the gist of it is we have to fund it somehow because our inspector from the insurance company pretty much said we had to do something uh, pretty drastic. Yeah. So, How much money are we expecting from Sutton Farm? 260? <sighs> For some reason, two, two, 202 is sticking in my head because we initially oh. thought it was going to be higher. Um, but for some reason, it's 202 is sticking in my head. And I don't think I have it in my file right here. I did mean to check, but I didn't get to that. But I, somehow, I think I have this budget in here. But, um, is you know, just a thought that would keep us from um, depleting the general fund if we didn't have to. I might have it right here. Two hundred six thousand one hundred twenty-five dollars. So, so it would still probably take a little bit more out of the general fund, but it wouldn't be the entire amount. So, okay. If we uh, flip to the second page, uh, there's only one item that is uh, marked for 2017. Um, and that this the second page covers all of the enterprise funds. Um, most of the items that you see listed are from 2018 and beyond. Um, the only item for 2017, which has not been folded into the regular budget, but was part of the uh, the budget scenarios when we were going through the uh, water plant um, funding and the um, rate increases, were the remote water meters. We finally got a uh, quote, um, which I know that uh, Johnny has been working diligently to try to get a, a solid number um, on this. We were estimating this originally at about a million dollars for remote water meters, and uh, that number that we got uh, was, was closer to the $700,000 mark. Now, this would not be uh, something that we would take directly out of the water fund all at once, this would be something that we would get financed. Um, so the remote water meters um, are pretty much a necessity with the new water plant because the water the water meters are so old, um, it's going to increase our accuracy in terms of metering the water that the, the water plant is pushing out. Um, so we do have that earmarked in 2017, um, but we're still in the early stages of trying to figure out what kinds of financing we might be able to get and what that would look like um, and cost on an annual basis. So we're still in the early stages of that. Um, but there are a number of items uh, across uh, electric, water, and uh, sewer from 2018 and beyond, which I'll just leave that with you guys instead of going through all of them. Can, can I ask one quick question? Mm -hmm. On the remote uh, water meters, <clears throat> do we have to purchase them all in 17? or because the plant will come online when? Uh, the plant comes online in 2018, correct? Or at least well, it's substan considered substantial completion at that point? Substantial completion okay. should be somewhere around November of 17, okay. as long as they stay on schedule. Okay. But 
yeah. And, and will they all be able to be done at once? John, in, in one year? Contracted again? The budget number that we obtained is a contractor coming in and installing them all at one time. They would actually project manage the whole system versus Melissa and I doing it this time. Um, the other thing that I will note is, is every third house will have what they call a leak detector on it. And so like at 3.30 in the morning, it will listen to hear if there's triple water in our main. So we'll be able to start detecting if we have a leak in a galvanized pipe that's in somebody's yard or a leak out of the main street. Mm -hmm. And we'll be able to narrow it down within a couple of two or three houses. Okay. So we'll be able to start monitoring where our loss is that Brad's making mm -hmm. and it doesn't get charged out by the meters. Mm -hmm. And that was for 2,200 meters, and I think half of it was inside and half of it was outside. Yeah, about. Mm -hmm. So we can't <coughs> we can't take on moving those meters, moving all the meters outside. Just what? if we moved them all outside, then we're more into probably the two million dollar range because then we have to have the cost on us to move them all outside. Hmm. Which we have installed, I've got four, we've installed 76 new meters of this caliber since uh, last year at this time. Uh, I went ahead and changed over because I knew we was going this way. So we've got 76 of them already in, either that's pits being moved outside or new construction. So. The plumbers are now on board with moving them all outside. The, the good thing, though, about the remote meters is even if they are inside, we can still get the reads from outside because that's the big problem right now is people work during the time that we're reading meters most of the time because we read meters from, you know, 8 to 4 every day, and those are prime work hours for people. So with us being able to read them remotely it removes that access uh, that we need to be able to get in to read meters every month so and if they do move the meter say they have an inside we do it inside that same meter goes from the inside to outside and nothing changes that's it, good we will still implement that the meters need to go outside if they have a problem so if they if they have to remodel it or repair it a major repair on the their side of the meter they got to move it out absolutely cool so if i understand you correctly we will be able to get them all installed before the plant comes online depending on how fast we act yes we literally just got the budget number just last week mm -hmm. Yeah, it was right before I had to have this submitted for packet, and I know that Johnny's been trying to get that number from him for probably a couple months, just because there's so many different variables that have to be taken into consideration to get a firm number. So any questions about the capital budget? And then Just one, one quick question. Fire hydrant, hydrant replacement, um, it, that's going to go out past 2021. 20, is that why the 75000 is different well, from the 40. You normally plan to replace some hydrants every year um, because you're always going to have one going bad in the system. So I think that's um, five a year, Johnny. Is that what you were thinking about? Yeah, I'm, yeah I'm actually it, it thinking does. It, about yeah, it says 75,000. I've got it marked 10,000 a year for four years, which should be 40,000. Okay. So yeah, that, that's, that's just a typo. It could have been because I take the same capital budget and I, I just recycle them every year. So we could have had more money earmarked and the formula just didn't get updated cool. so I'll, I'll update that thank you brian Go, going back to this Sutton farm money did, did that grant come through did i miss something which to the to the glen they know her. no oh no, no not not officially they have to still do their appraisal they're probably not going to run into any problems getting it because the money is there for them to be awarded it so oh, okay I, I, if if I were a betting person, I would say they're going to get their grant. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, uh, what going to ask? I lost track of it. It's almost. I'm time passing. Yeah. 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 Forget yeah. it. I've just lost my train of thought there for a minute. 
Okay, so then the final piece to be presented tonight are the enterprise fund budgets. Um, so this is electric, water, sewer, and solid waste. Um, and I have a Reader's Digest version uh, that's on the cover page here, which shows uh, a very uh, easy to read, um, or at least I think it's easy to read, color coded um, synopsis of the funds, um, high level overview of revenues and expenditures, and whether or not we are our revenues are over or under our expenses. And uh, that, that same uh, outline is used for each of the funds, and then there's at, at the bottom of the page, a roll up of all of the revenues for all of the enterprise funds, all of the expenses, and whether or not our revenues were over or under. So if we look at 2016 just briefly, the 2016 budget was set um, across all of the enterprise funds to uh, go into the red approximately a million dollars, um, which part of that was the electric fund. Um, we moved $500,000 into uh, capital improvement to, um, to earmark uh, some money for some improvements that we knew were going to be coming up so that that was a huge driver of that but if we look at the 2016 projected um, at the end of the year we're only set to uh, dip into those reserves 485,000 um, so part of that was the electric fund um, well actually the only part that went into the the red was the electric fund um, and then the water the sewer and the solid waste were all um, were all in the black so if we look at 2017 um, I'm super happy that all of the enterprise funds are set to be in the black. Um, the electric fund will be in the black by approximately $85,000. Uh, water fund, uh, 162000 uh, in the black. Um, sewer fund, 101000 in the black. And the solid waste fund, breaking even, which uh, that fund, uh, that's, that's typical for that since it's a contract out and it's an easy in and out. So um, with each of those funds, um, any rate increases that were scheduled uh, were included in those revenue um, projections, which we'll see another 30% in water and another 15% in uh, sewer. And then off to the right in the green section, uh, you'll see what our recommended reserve balances are, which is four months of operating, which I apply to all of the uh, budgets that we look at. And all of the um, uh, funds are set to be above the reserves. Um, the water fund, um, we're, we're trying to build up those reserves um, with the rate increases because uh, we should start seeing the first uh, debt service payment on the new water plant in 2018. So uh, we'll have a full year of 2017 of those rate increases to prepare for that to occur in 2018. And that includes the debt service on the two loans? That Yes, the, the loop and the loop uh, completion and the bottleneck elimination, those uh, loan payments are already figured into the 2017 budget. Um, so we do have uh, we do have those that we're prepared for. So if we look in at the next page, uh, we'll take a, a look at the electric fund. Um, as with all of the enterprise funds, the majority of the uh, the revenues are a direct result of the consumer fees. Um, the electric fund is kind of an interesting fund um, because we do have our power costs, which if you look down at our expenses, that's in our contractual services. You'll see the, the multi-million dollar number there, uh, which is uh, directly attributed to our power costs. Um, with, our, with our rates, um, we do have a power cost adjustment. So if our power costs increase um, then individual utility bills will increase to uh, to ad to adjust and reflect that uh, additional cost of power um, in 2017 we do have one more hydro project that's uh, set to come online which is the smithland project after that then all of the uh, hydro projects that we are involved in should be online at that point um, so the the main the main components of the electric fund are the consumer fees that come in and then the uh, power costs that we have so these these are kind of moving targets amp provides us with projections for our power costs um, however I've noticed that those are usually um, inflated so um, in 2017 I actually had a, a conversation with John Courtney just this afternoon and I told him how um, uncomfortable I am sometimes with some of AMP's predictions. 
and I told him that this year I'm I'm going to just try to work off of um, what I think is a more realistic approach in terms of our power costs, and he was supportive of that. Um, so um, we are looking at power cost of uh, approximately I think that let me let me look at my uh, detail. The power costs that I had uh, projected were uh, so that you know how much of the total is actually the power cost is two million four hundred and thirty three thousand so um, that's the that's the big the big driving factor of the expenditures on the electric side but if we back up and we look at the revenues I predict that we'll bring in approximately three point four million dollars with the electric fund um, in 2016, we only had uh, a rate increase, uh, which was 9% across the board, that started uh, July 1st. So we did not see a full year's realization of that, um, which is why the revenues are down versus what I had projected um, at the beginning of 20 2016. Um, because I I braced when I originally did the 2016 budget that we would have had the rate increase start in January, and we did not. So. Um, a full year's increase should be approximately uh, 3.4 million dollars on the revenue side and then our expenditures are set to come in uh, a total of 3,374,997 which will put us in the black again by 85,753. Any questions on electric which is probably the most complicated of all of the funds? Okay we'll take a look at water um, on the revenue side, we do have another 30% increase. So I am projecting that our um, revenues on the water side will be approximately 974,361. If we look at our expenses, um, our expenses are um, a little bit lower than what was budgeted in um, 2016. Um, not by an incredible amount, um, but we don't have any capital purchases that are coming out of the, the water fund. Um, the only thing that will change is the water distribution side, those meters that we were just talking about. We will have a loan payment that could potentially hit in 20, uh, 2017. Um, but if we look at the debt service on the water distribution side, that's where the existing bottleneck um, elimination and loop completion loans uh, do come into the budget. So we have um, across water distribution and water treatment a total of 812,286 in expenditures, which will put us approximately 162,000 in the black. Any questions on water? Okay. Um, sewer. On the revenue side, we have another 15% increase. Um, so then in 2017, uh, I am predicting that we will have revenues which equate to 963,958. And then if we look at the expenditures, we have two departments in that fund as well. We have sewer collection and we have sewer treatment. Um, there is a little bit of debt service um, which are listed in uh, these funds. We have uh, a jet vac lease which comes out of sewer collection. And then in sewer treatment, we have uh, the wastewater treatment plant upgrade loan um, that we're still paying on. And then if you notice, we do have transfers out from both of those uh, departments in, in the amounts of 25000 each for a total of 50000 for our uh, sewer capital improvement fund. So total expenses, 862668 and that puts us in the black approximately 101000 Any questions on sewer? All right. Jason and Brad. The last one that we have is the uh, solid waste fund. Um, this is a really easy in and out. Um, approximately 260,000 are projected to come in in consumer fees, which is a total of 262,200 overall because we do sell some uh, trash bags and trash stickers. And then um, with the expenses, that's our contract with Rumkey. And so that's set to, to expend out what we bring in if it works out just fine. So. Total enterprise fund expenses are five million three hundred twelve thousand one hundred fifty-two dollars. Okay. Cool. So, any questions on any of that that I just gave you very quickly? No. Well, just one quick question. So, the in the in the black. I mean, is that ultimately preparing for these loan payments that we're going to be? Well, for the year. Water for sure. Yeah. 
we're trying to build those reserves up because they were significantly depleted to the point where right. if you remember the consulting for the um, water plant we had to move two hundred twenty five thousand dollars from the general fund just to support it because the water fund couldn't support it so right. we're trying to build the water fund back up for sure okay and one thing that we want to start doing out of uh, sewer collection Jason and I have talked about is starting to do some sewer relining projects to reduce our I and I into the plant um, and so we need to build up a certain amount of reserves to even I mean, fifty thousand dollars is minimum on that, and it doesn't really get you more than a block or two. But and those are reflected in the capital budget with yeah. the yep. the sewer relying part. But if we build up the reserves in the operating, then that can every annually some gets moved into the capital to help us do those projects that we are long term. Okay. Yeah, I think it's just good to emphasize that, that mm -hmm. you know why we're doing that. Right. So the next uh, the next meeting, what we'll do, we did have a few revisions to the general fund budget. Um, we'll take a look at the uh, transfers that we were moving out to support those capital improvement funds, and then um, so we'll I'll just hit the high points with any revisions that I made from the the last budgets, and then um, we'll be ready for the ordinance. So doesn't I mean, look like an incredible amount of work needs to be done yet. I definitely would want us to look at the green space fund. Five thousand mm -hmm. dollars seems inadequate. Uh, I would not like us to do that. <laughs> well, all I, mean, of, I think all of the, the minimum we've done yearly has been about twenty-five thousand. I think that's the minimum we should do. I know you're saying mm -hmm. leave it in the general fund, uh, and then if there's a need, you pull it out of the general fund. Um, I did want to ask if if you take the uh, Sutton Farm money, if you if we didn't use the Sutton Farm monies for the staff um, facilities um, how much does it deplete the general fund you said it greatly depletes. Your general fund um, I think I, I brought that up the general fund right now at the end of 2017 if we did without any changes because this isn't the the marked up copy um, at the end of 2017 we would have approximately 1.9 million and we need um, we need about 1.1 million in it so we've got about an extra eight hundred thousand um, dollars worth of cushion above our reserves so um, we have built that up a little bit mm -hmm. so we can decide I mean you haven't you haven't identified the revenue piece for that right the funding no. piece for that yeah okay no so we can that could be a discussion yeah, item when we go through and we look at everything as a whole because I mean those transfers out to those capital improvement projects was something that I specifically wanted council to make decisions on green space and the others okay. so let's let's move on let's okay. do that I, I do I have a question I'm oh, sorry I'm sorry mm -hmm. think of it at the time but um, what about sidewalks I recall we had fifty thousand dollars a year for sidewalks it doesn't it doesn't seem like it's broken out here it's in contractual services along with the paving for streets and do you know whether it's been spent at, at that rate um I that's a question for Jason yeah I know we've done that. we've done some sidewalk projects every year um, obviously with streetscape we spent substantially more than fifty thousand dollars um, on those but we've also done some repairs around Mills lawn we did the out front here um, to make it ADA compliant um, okay. out by the ramp as well as up the street um, there have been some other spot repairs that we've done so most of what we've spent has been on streetscape in the last few years in addition to all of the other spaces that we've done so okay. thank you. I mean I would like to I would like to continue with somewhat of the spot fixes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, again, going out and getting these worst sections that, that people are falling on and that are dangerous. Well, right. Jerry and I are supposed to be making a report back to council about sidewalks, and we have a date set to meet. So, mm -hmm. so that's why I just remembered that. Mm -hmm. so, and, cool. and, and Jason, that's what he regularly does is when he gets ready to let the contract, he goes out because when we bid it out, we have to mark the sections so that they can go out and look at how many different locations they have to do and okay. set up. So Sounds good. Um, so we'll get the summary at the next meeting.
Um, no, I, I had requested to talk briefly about the glass farm. Right, okay. But frankly, I'm like ready to wrap this up. I, I guess so my request would be to have it as Is an it, item. Oh, nice, okay. And, and to have it before the budget. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah, we can do that. Well, we've been putting the. If you see, we've actually put the budget last yeah. every time. So I'm sure the staff would have preferred the budget. And I don't think the rest of the staff right. needs needs to be here. Yeah. No, just the initial presentation in case people right. did have specific questions about what's been done, what's going to be done, what's in the capital. That they're the best people to answer those right. things. Okay. No new. Can I just ask a real quick question? When we were discussing, I'm. We're going back to the discussion, are we, in terms of the uh, budget about the funding for um, our commissions and all that? I've kind of lost. Yeah, that. that's the next meeting. The next we meeting. we come we okay. circle back around to the general fund at that time. Okay, so and, that's what. And you'll see the up. the update okay. that I made in the next right. presentation. Yep. Thank you. Okay, moving on to manager's report. Okay, other, I have some additional things. So the only thing I'm gonna mention in my, um, that's in my actual printed report because we've covered some and we've talked about others. I do wanna thank the Yellow Springs Community Foundation because they did award the village oh, wow. $7,500 to help pay for part of our fiber needs assessment. So I really appreciate that very much. Uh, don't forget the trick or treat is the 31st from six to eight. Um, I did receive some communication from Stony Creek Garden Center. Um, they would like to make some improvements to their property. Uh, their lease currently runs through December of 2017. However, um, if they are going to invest in the um, improvements that they've talked about, which include a couple of, uh, of buildings um, to help um, brand the front entrance out there a little bit and also to have a uh, a nice shoppable spot for their customers. Um, they would like to extend their lease through December of 2019. So if council is amenable to that, I will bring a revised lease agreement um, and resolution to the next meeting. Sounds reasonable. Yep. Thanks. Um, I would like uh, to start the team building. Um, the staff is going to do some team building and it's going to include uh, myself, all of my direct reports and um, I believe council would also like Judy to be involved. We're talking uh, about um, contracting with Professor Brenda Craner from Wright State University, and I know that Brian and Karen have spoken with her um, on behalf of council, and um, that she also, I believe, would like all of council to be involved to a certain extent. So we will be bringing some more information about that to the next meeting as well. Okay. Um, and finally, the, uh, I have received a communication about the Welcome Back Art Show, which Brian mentioned during uh, communications. It's a conceptual proposal. Um, I'm still waiting on some additional information from it, but essentially um, two artists, Aaron Smith and Tom Verdon, would like to display in the Bryan Center Gallery. Um, and um, when I get the further information on that, I can bring that back to council um, for further discussion. Um, hoping to have it by the next meeting because they wanted to uh, display in conjunction with Art Stroll, although I think we're going to be cutting that a little bit close if I don't get the information um, really soon. Okay. So. Hey, Patty, just real quick. Did I read earlier that the um, that we got a donation to cover the, the new bike corral? We did. And I mean, is that a pri is it's that a, a private? Anonymous? Yes. Private domain. That's nice. really cool. Nice. Um, okay. Oh, uh, can I just ask real quick on the fiber needs assessment? How much was that? I'm forgetting. Forty-eight thousand five hundred. So there. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. It seems like staff's done really well at reaching out and helping find other resources. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, Melissa. Melissa, thank you. <laughs> I'm working on the budget nonstop, so <laughs> that's it. <laughs> You can read mine, but uh, just as we've had quite a slew of public records requests. Um, we've spent about 43 hours uh, in the last three weeks, and we're not done yet. So that's a significant time chomp right there. And then I have put some information regarding public records requests in that scintillating clerk report that you can read at your leisure. Thank you. 
uh, future agenda items. Um, so we're finishing up the budget. Um, we've got the two um, pieces of legislation, second readings of the two um, alley vacations. Actually, you are only reading one of them. There's a weird delay because of the petition submitted with the request in the first place. So it can't get read until November 21st. So what you see on the screen is actually what you will see at the next. Okay, meeting. so that's the that's the first one we heard. Then the uh, stop sign legislation. Mm -hmm. What we just added was to bring back the um, resolution regarding the RFP for infrastructure. Um, Patty will bring information regarding a team building project with staff. Um, Mary Ann will have a discussion item related to the glass farm. And um, Patty will also bring, I am assuming, legislation related to Stony Creek? Yes. Okay. And glass farm, is that something that, will there be materials on that or? Um, mm, no, but I'll, just I'll discussion. talk with you beforehand. Okay. Can you, Judy, can I mean, it's always about, nice to have something so in the packet to refer to if there's well, I if want there's to talk something. with you about yeah. the conversation Patty and I had and then okay. we can decide. Um, so, anything else? Um, I would like to add something to the November 7th. Okay. Um, Rachel McKinley has been working to revamp the investment policy, and um, she has generally got that done, and it needs to come before council as a resolution for passage. Okay. So, um, um, investment? Investment policy. So, so that'll be resolution, okay. It'll be a resolution, yes. And uh, we can put it on the 7th of November. Okay. Um, anything else moving forward besides? Okay. You know what's next. Anybody want to adjourn this yeah, meeting? Yeah, I move that we adjourn. <laughs> Second. <laughs> All those in what? favor signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.